All right, um, so with that, uh, welcome everyone to today's keyboard hacking stream. Um, my name is Michael. Uh, you may know me from other projects such as the i3 window manager um, or a bunch of ghost stuff uh, more recently. Um, I, in my spare time, I also dabble in hobby electronics. Uh, specifically, I got into keyboard hacking. Um, let me tell you how all of this worked uh, or came to be. So um, Kinesis is a company that makes ergonomic keyboards, most notably the Advantage 2, um, which is the one that I'm going to talk about and I'm going to show you and I'm going to modify. Uh, they have a whole line of other ergonomic keyboards, so if other styles are your jam, then that's totally fine too. Uh, it's just this particular one intrigued me, uh, and I had the chance to try it out, I think, um, or maybe I bought it blind. I can't even quite remember. Um, I think I might have bought it blind, but then I was very happy with it, and then I gave other people the chance to try it out, and they've also been happy with it. Uh, so these are not so super easy to find um, because they're rather expensive for a computer keyboard, but they have a couple of nice properties that I want to go over with you. Um, to begin with, um, well, actually, let me let me not talk uh, while I have this picture open. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through it on the actual on the actual hardware, and that way we're gonna we're gonna test uh, the webcam setup here. So let's see. Let me rearrange this. Cool. Um, and then if I switch to this scene here, cool. Okay, so now you can actually see on my desk. Um, all right, uh, so you can clearly see that I haven't uh, cleaned this keyboard in a while. Um, there's some residue there. Uh, that's what happens, but uh, at some point I'm gonna clean it anyway. Um, so this keyboard, it has a bunch of very interesting properties. Uh, one property that is very obvious to anyone who looks at it is that it has this weird form, right? It has this curved uh, key bowl here where sort of uh, your hands kind of go into it, right? Um, if, you, if you think about it, like the most natural position for a hand um, when you are in resting position, like if you just laid your arm on the table, it would be something like this, right? Um, I'm not stretching it out, so I'm, I'm not putting any strain on, on my knuckles here. Um, I'm, I'm not making a fist either, I'm just letting it rest comfortably, right? This is sort of the, the natural position. Now, if you were to translate this position into resting your hand in a keyboard, um, the way it would work on the kinesis is you just transfer it like this, right? Uh, so you can see that I'm still uh, kind of in resting position, right? And I can just rest my hand in that same position on here. Uh, and the the key well is actually formed such that my fingers uh, fit on these keys perfectly, right? Um, so you can see the J, K, L semicolon is the home row, and then uh, K is further in, furthest actually, uh, than J, and L is a little bit less so, and then the semicolon is the least in because it's for the small finger, right? Um, so this is why it's curved. Um, then that's not the only feature that it has. Uh, another feature, if I turn it just a little bit that you can see is that uh, all of these keys are arranged in a matrix layout, right? They are one on top of the other. Uh, so if you learn a keyboard layout, uh, you no longer need to make these weird um, diagonal movements between rows that the QWERTY layout has by default on regular uh, keyboards, uh, on regular computer keyboards, but also typewriter keyboards before that, right? Um, the the sort of well-known explanation for why the keys are shifted on most of the keyboards that we have is that uh, for the older typewriters, it was necessary to arrange them like that to avoid jams. Now, obviously on a computer, you don't have that problem, but people were so used to it that you know the, the manufacturers kind of stuck to that layout. Um, this is not so in the Kinesis and in some other ergonomics, ergonomic keyboards as well. Um, and I feel like it makes a positive difference, uh, both in terms of hand and finger movement. It's it's easier, it's more natural, you know where they are, but also in terms of the learning process. So I really like that kind of arrangement. Then, um, continuing the tour, uh, we have this thumb block here, um, which is one, two, three, four, five, six keys that you can press with your thumb instead of the one shared key that you have on regular PC keyboard. Um, where you just have the space bar and you use it with both of your thumbs for some reason, you know, for some reason, right? So the thumb blocks that we have here 
are actually such an upgrade. Like it's like you have a whole new keyboard under your thumbs, right? Uh, suddenly you have these 12 keys that you can comfortably press with your thumb, where previously you had one. Uh, and that's like, that's a super big thing to get used to. And then when you go back to other keyboards, you kind of miss it. Um, then uh, these things here are the thumb pads. Uh, they're just for resting your hand. You don't necessarily need to put them there. Uh, you can buy some new ones if they uh, get old and, and kind of fall apart after many, many years of use. Uh, I think myself, I have exchanged my thumb pads once or twice in the like 10 plus years that I have this keyboard. Um, but your mileage may vary. I know people who don't like these pads at all and they just use the keyboard bare as it is. Um, so that is like sort of the, you know, the, the, the hardware is great. Um, I really like the, the case. Uh, I like the bowls. I like the matrix design. Um, I like, I like pretty much everything that I just talked about and that you can see from the outside, right? Um, there are a couple of things where you could think, oh, there might be a further improvement here somewhere, um, at, at some point down the line, right? For example, uh, let me actually take this and give you a shot without this cable. Um, so this is like the full keyboard. Um, and like the, the hand position is okay for me, but some people might prefer to move the two halves wider apart. And it's currently not possible um, because the keyboard is just one piece, right? And that also means that you can't kind of fold it for traveling. Uh, you need to have enough space in your luggage that you can put a full size keyboard in there. Now, granted, um, when I was um, when I was still studying um, and doing an internship, um, I actually only had one of these keyboards, and I was carrying it to work every day in my backpack. So it's certainly possible to take it with you, um, but it would be nicer for travel if it was more compact, like if it was split into two halves. Um, so that would be cool, um, but that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, there are a couple of other things that are not just improvements, but things where the Kinesis is actually bad uh, in the older revision. So the one that you see here on stream is actually the uh, what's called the KB500. It's the Kinesis Advantage, the first generation. Uh, and I'm going to show you in just a second the KB600, which is the more recent model uh, released in 2017. Um, which has a bunch of, of nice hardware improvements. Okay, um, by the way, uh, I thought it goes without saying, but if you have any questions at any point, uh, just ask me in chat um, and I will try to cover them. So, um, okay, so rewind back in time, right? It's like 2008-ish um, and I get this keyboard and I'm happy with it, but there are a couple of problems. So one of the problems is that the um, function keys here are like, they're really a joke, right? Like if I wobble here, you can see that this is just a flimsy, uh, you know, feels like gummy almost. Um, and like, it has just this, and we're gonna see it when we open this up. Uh, it has this weird, um, yeah, I, I don't even know how to call it precisely. It's just not a mechanical thing. It's not a mechanical switch. It's also not, I don't think it's a rubber dome uh, uh, key thing either. Um, it's really weird. Like it's a special thing that they have glued on there uh, from, from the bottom. Um, and the F keys are not mechanical. That is really like, yeah, it's a huge oversight um, or a huge compromise that they had to make for some reason. Uh, I, I really don't like it. It leads to me not using the F keys very much, though um, I hope that with the KB600, um, yeah, that's actually changed in the KB600. I'm gonna show you how in just a sec. Then um, aside from the function keys, um, the regular keys uh, are Cherry MX key switches. Um, let me actually switch back here and uh, show you um, the Cherry MX product page. If it actually wants to load. Uh, let me see. Oh, cool. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, for sure. For the best experience, I need to accept cookies. Um, this is in German. Let me switch it to English. Yeah, nice. Um, so Cherry is um, a company that actually switched um, a couple of times in terms of ownership. I think it actually started out in the US and then they, they uh, became a subsidiary of a German company for the longest time. 
I think now they're US owned since very recent again. Anyway, um, these are like very, very long standing, uh, a very, very long standing manufacturer of keyboard switches, um, mechanical keyboard switches to be precise. And the MX series is like a very widely available and loved uh, series of key switches. Um, there are other vendors of key switches. Oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is much more marketing than I expected from the last time that I viewed this page. Uh, we're gonna have a look if we can find something better. Um, cool, maybe this, oh yeah, this this looks better. Cool. Um, there are other vendors, like there are um, uh, on the Asian market, there are a couple of more, you know, cheaper uh, keyboard switch uh, producers that have products that are similar to the cherry ones. Uh, you know, the, the cherry ones with their distinct colors here, you can see that all of the different models are named after a color and they actually have that color. Um, so this is very distinguishable um, and all of the other vendors kind of just copied that is my impression of it. Um, let me let me pause here for just a second, catch up with the chat. Um, I'd be curious if you could go into whether or not the keys can be remapped at a hardware level instead of the OS level. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about this. Um, I'm gonna talk about this when we cover the controller. So let me finish my thought on the, um, on the key switches first. So um, Kinesis, if we go back to the advantage, um, you can see that they have different key switches that they put into their models. So they have the Cherry MX Brown, which are characterized as tactile feel that they put in the Advantage 2 as like the standard model. And that's actually not a bad choice uh, for many typists, I think, uh, in an office setting, especially. Uh, then they have an option to put in the Cherry MX Red ones. This is kind of a more recent option that I think they only introduced with the Advantage 2 series. And um, that's pretty much it though. So I actually like the others better. So for the longest time, I've been typing on Cherry MX Blues. Um, and when I got my Kinesis that had the MX Browns in them, uh, I really felt a difference and I, I didn't really like it. Um, I thought that maybe I could get used to it and tried it for a couple of weeks, but uh, it didn't stick. So I was still longing to have the MX Blues um, on my keyboard. Um, and I did that and I'm gonna talk about that more later, um, but let's actually talk more um, about the shortcomings. So we've covered the function keys, we've covered that uh, different keyboard switches is what I would like to use. And then lastly, the one thing that really got me into the whole keyboard hacking thing is that the keyboard actually had a bug. And the bug was that uh, if you press shift and then you press the letter, it would register correctly. But then uh, if you release shift, it wouldn't capture that release. Um, so sometimes I, I call this the stuck modifier problem because the shift modifier gets stuck, so to say, right? So sometimes during typing a sentence, everything would be in uppercase. Um, so that's kind of annoying, right? Um, but it depends on how often it happens before it really becomes annoying. So the issue with this one was that the problem only happened like a couple of times per week at most. Uh, sometimes there were weeks where it didn't happen at all, and then sometimes there were weeks where it happened all the time. Um, I don't actually know, like I, I didn't actually ever had a chance to diagnose this problem because it was in closed source keyboard controllers from Kinesis, but um, what I could do at the time was I Googled and I figured out that in the forums, there were people who were reporting that they had the same problem and they were reporting that they had um, contacted the tech support at Kinesis and then they had given them a update, an update for their keyboard. Um, and with the update, the problem was fixed. Uh, was the stuck modifier on the Advantage 1 or Advantage 2 also? Definitely had the issue on my Advantage 1. Yeah, that was at, with the Advantage 1. Um, so in the timeline right now, I'm kind of like in 2008-ish. Um, no, actually a couple of years after that, I think, because I think I, for a couple of years, I actually just had the Advantage 1. I was just using it. And then after some years, the problem became annoying enough that I did something about it. And that was in 2013 or 2012. So kind of around that time. That was before the Advantage 2 was released. Um, so in the forums, I read that people were having the same problem and they were getting a firmware update. So I was like, huh, I should probably contact tech support and get that firmware update, right? It would be cool to have that issue fixed. So I did send them an email um, and they, uh, well, somebody saying Advantage 2 does not have the issue, mine works fine. Yeah, um, I'm gonna tell you why that is uh, in just a sec. So uh, I contacted tech support at Kinesis and they started this lengthy questioning process where 
Um, they would ask me all sorts of details, do all sorts of troubleshooting procedures. I did all of it with them. Um, they were happy with it. And then at some point, um, eventually they gave up sort of saying, well, like, yeah, okay, I, I guess you really do have that problem. Uh, we should send you the firmware update. Um, as a last step, could you please also let us know your address? And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, and then I gave them the address and uh, for a while, nothing happened. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, I, uh, when I was about to actually ask them uh, via email, like when would they send me the file? Uh, I got a letter in the post, uh, like a physical letter. Um, and they had actually sent me not a firmware update file, but a new microcontroller. <laughs> And the new microcontroller, um, it came along with an instruction sheet for how to insert it into their keyboard controller. So uh, when they were talking about an update, they meant actually you know, a ROM that is on a microcontroller that they cannot update remotely. They had to actually ch ship out the replacement chips to their customers, uh, which is why I can understand that they're a little bit hesitant to do that uh, in the first place. But anyway, so I inserted the new microcontroller with the new ROM, and that did fix the issue for the shift key. Now, there is one additional issue, which was really, really annoying, which was that I not only use the shift key as a modifier, I also use the caps lock key as a modifier. Uh, this is because I type in a layout, which is called um, Neo layout. Actually, um, let me actually enable this as well. Yeah, um, it was a, a new X session, so I didn't have it loaded at the time properly. Okay, um, so the Neo layout is kind of interesting in that it is a rearrangement of keys uh, to be more ergonomic um, and to make typing, you know, more comfortable for you. Um, the first layer is lowercase, as you would expect. The second layer is uppercase, as you would expect. And then comes the third layer, um, which is programming symbols. So this is where all of the uh, slashes and parens are and uh, special characters that you need to use uh, to write program source code. These are all very conveniently located on the third layer, which is activated by the caps lock key. So I use them all the time. Uh, and for the caps lock key, it turns out that Kinesis, the old one, even with the new microcontroller, still had the stuck modifier bug for caps lock only. Uh, so at that point, I was like, okay, so I could now contact Kinesis and I could try to explain to them that I'm using caps lock as a modifier and that they should invest more resources and release a new ROM and then send me the updated microcontroller just to fix this very issue. Um, but at that point, I was like, hmm, maybe we can do something about this uh, on our own uh, without having to resort to this, um, without having to cooperate with Kinesis and, and convince them that this is an issue worth fixing. Um, I haven't actually told them about this. It was just more fun to do it myself then at that point. Uh, so let me open up the blog post about this. Uh, that's the one that I published in 2013. Uh, so this talks about the stock modifier thing. And then I found the Humble Hacker keyboard, uh, which is uh, a keyboard by David Whetstone, who actually as a first prototype did work with the Kinesis keyboard. And he documented his modifications in his blog. Um, so he had, and I think it's still online. Uh, yeah, um, here it is. So if I click continue reading, Cool. Um, he has like all of the pinouts on here. Um, you can see that this is an even older revision. This is not even the Kinesis Advantage that I had um, because it's using this um, weird PCB connector here. There's not even a proper flex cable that they use nowadays. Um, so this is even older, but it did work for the one that I had. So I did replicate um, David's findings and I used his keyboard matrix to actually build my own keyboard controller. What you can see here is the old original Kinesis keyboard controller. Uh, this is the microcontroller that I had to replace. Um, and you can see that all of these components are rather old. So they're like, um, uh, you have a bunch of, of chips that have these uh, legs here, and um, you have these through hole resistors uh, where you would really expect SMD resistors nowadays. So even at the time when I got the keyboard, this was a very old tech. Um, and you could see actually that they had a sort of uh, sister board uh, alongside this board on the other side of the keyboard. This will become more clear as I actually open one up um, where they converted this one from PS2 to USB. So it was not even native USB, the controller that they had at the time. Um, so I did a couple of prototypes here um, with like self-made PCBs, which was fun. I did it at a friend's lab um, at the time. 
Um, we did put uh, the Teensy microcontroller on it, which was also what David Whetstone was using. Um, you can see the, the PCB here. I'm going to talk more about how all of this works, um, but this is the old stuff and I want to explain to you based on the new stuff. Um, so this was 2013 um, and that was how I kind of got into this whole project. Um, and then later, um, actually just, uh, let me see. Here, yeah, 2018, um, I did release a new series of blog posts actually, where I did release my new keyboard controller work, um, where I was getting curious about input latency. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I outlined this here as well, um, you know, with the, with the original one. There's this great blog post here um, from a person called Pavel uh, Faten, I think. Um, sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, and the, the blog post, like you can see, is a lengthy post, right? Uh, but it talks about a lot of different things um, and it's super, super interesting to follow. Um, so if you haven't read it, I would recommend you give it a read. Uh, it's called Typing with Pleasure. I have linked it here from my blog post. Um, and so this, this like got me into input latency. Uh, so very briefly, we can talk more about this later, but I want to give you like a broad overview first, and then we can sort of dive into the specifics in a little bit. Um, input latency in general in a keyboard is caused by three major uh, factors. So what a keyboard controller does is it scans all of the keys to see if any of them was pressed. And then it needs to debounce the signal because when you press a physical key switch, it's not like a clean transition from uh, high to low or from enabled to disabled. Um, it is a messy signal in the physical world that oscillates as the material makes contact in the switch. Um, so you need to sort of deal with that physical phenomenon. And uh, an easy way to do this is just to, to either very slowly scan your keys um, or uh, you scan your keys and then you delay reporting the key press until you're certain that the signal level has changed. Um, there are better ways to do this, um, which is that as soon as the signal changes, you report the change and then you debounce it, meaning you enable the key like a little bit after you first register it as enabled. Uh, this has the advantage that it doesn't slow you down while typing. It doesn't introduce any latency and it's uh, just as good, uh, just as precise a mechanism as the others. So essentially, when you do a key press, when you press the key here, maybe you have to wait until the next matrix scan if the keyboard doesn't scan its matrix very uh, frequently, which it might not to conserve power, depending on what sort of keyboard it is. Uh, you see this on, for example, Bluetooth wireless keyboards that you have for notebooks. Primarily, um, these scan very rarely. Um, and then even if you have a keyboard that scans quickly, um, you might have one that uses a debouncing algorithm that delays key presses. And then uh, even if you have one that is kind of okay, uh, maybe it's not running at the best USB speeds uh, and it takes a long time for the USB polling to actually ask the keyboard for updates. Um, so you can see that there are a bunch of different places where latency um, can be introduced in, uh, you know, between you pressing a key and the computer registering that you have pressed a key. So I really wanted to understand this whole subject and I really wanted to figure out what sort of latency my keyboard controller had. Uh, and you know, given that it was a keyboard controller that I had made for myself, nobody could tell me what sort of latency it had. I had to figure it out myself. Um, so in order to do this, um, in order to like really get an understanding from the ground up uh, for the entire the entirety of software and hardware, etc., that happens there, I decided to um, start with a new version of the TNZ, the TNZ 3.6, which is actually a lot faster than the old version, um, and notably it has a USB 2 high-speed port, uh, which the older teensies didn't have. Uh, and there is actually a difference in uh, how frequently USB poles between the versions. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of findings here, but um, the USB 2 high-speed, uh, it, like, if you, if you look here, the input latency with USB 1, you can kind of get it in between either zero milliseconds in the best case, right? Like you press and right after the keyboard scans, right after it is being pulled, et cetera, if everything lines up just right, it could be like no perceptible or measurable latency. But if everything goes just wrong, you will have like 1.1 milliseconds of latency. Uh, the measurements kind of average out. So, you know, in 
on average, like the keyboard will feel only as fast as the average key press is kind of, um, you will be somewhere in the middle here. Um, can you go further? Yes, with USB 2.0 high speed, you can decrease the polling interval from one millisecond to zero milliseconds, 0 0.125 to be precise, but that doesn't really matter on that scale of things. Um, so I decided to actually implement this, but there was one mechanical problem here, which is that the USB high speed port on the TNZ 3.6 was in a very inconvenient location. Um, I'm going to show this to you when we open up the keyboard. Uh, yeah, it, it would just, you would not be able to mount a physical USB port at that location. So that was kind of out of the question. So I resorted to doing my own PCB that was just essentially using the same chip that the Teensy was using. Um, but so, so this is kind of a Teensy, right? It's like a Teensy descendant. Um, it contains a few parts less, um, but it does have the very characteristic um, uh, flashing chip that the Teensy uses where you have the, you know, the Teensy is, it's, a, it's an interesting little microcontroller um, let me actually show you. Um, all right, let me switch to my iPhone cam. So this is the this is the Teensy microcontroller. Um, let me see. Yeah, you can see it here. Um, it's called Teensy because it's Teensy tiny, right? Um, but one thing that is really cool about it that they started with the Atmel series, um, I think, is the push button for um, reprogramming it. So you connect it here via USB, and then um, when you connect it via USB, as soon as you press the button, it goes into a special bootloader mode, and it allows you to update the firmware no matter what sort of state you got it in. So if you entirely like mess up your firmware image and it doesn't even start the microcontroller anymore, uh, it's not a problem. You can always recover it. So it's kind of unbreakable. And that's a really cool thing. And they wanted to um, retain that feature as they uh, moved into more recent Teensy versions. But um, they switched away from um, Atmel microcontrollers to the ARM microcontrollers, um, such as this one here on the Teensy 4.1. Um, you can see that um, at the top, you still have the USB port, but this time it's a micro USB port. As far as I know, there's no USB-C Teensies out there yet, but that is certainly a thing that will probably come uh, uh, sooner rather than later, and it's going to be much appreciated. Now, there are a couple of other smaller... Um, sorry, you can't actually see that here. There are a couple of other smaller chips alongside the bigger chip. So the big one in the middle here is the CPU or the microcontroller. Um, and then there are a couple of others here, and one of them is the bootloader helper chip. So on the more recent uh, Teensies, you have a separate chip um, for this particular function, and that is a chip that you can just buy in the Teensy store. Uh, so that's how I added it to my own design here. Um, and the button here is the push button for reprogramming. So this design too is unbreakable like that. Um, but it also means that you need to order this special IC from the Teensy store, and you can't actually work with the microcontroller until you have that. Um, so it means that you can't as easily buy the components. So there's ups and downsides to every decision here. All right, um, so then I wrote a bare metal firmware from scratch for this particular platform, um, just to make sure that I had a clean baseline measurement of the latency. Um, and it turns out that with USB 2 high speed in my custom design with the custom firmware, et cetera, et cetera, I could actually measure that my input latency was always within zero milliseconds and 0 0.225 milliseconds, which as far as I know is the best documented finding in the world. Nobody else apparently has done a USB 2 high speed keyboard controller yet, um, at least at the time of writing. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, and then I did a couple of other um, uh, smaller changes as well. Um, yeah, let me, let me briefly go over it, but then um, I actually want to show you the actual keyboard um, because we've waited long enough. Um, so what I also did is a USB hub, um, which will replace the uh, Kinesis original USB hub. It turns out the KB600, the newer Advantage 2 keyboard, doesn't actually have a USB hub anymore. Um, so maybe a cool modification would be to add one to it, given that I already have the design and can just build one. Um, it should be relatively simple, just need to have some mounts and a hole in the right place in the case. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that later too. Um, and then lastly, for the um, latency measurement, I wanted to give other people the chance to reproduce my findings uh, more easily than having to uh, you know, build this custom design of mine that I came up with. 
So um, I ported the, the firmware to the um, development boards that, you know, for the, for the um, let me see, the, it was called FRDM. I think they, wanna, they want us to call it Freedom K66F. I don't know, man, marketing. Um, but uh, this this board can be bought for 60 US dollars. Um, I have it behind me. I could fetch it, but not particularly important. Um, but what you can do with it, um, oh, I don't have a picture in this article, that's too bad. Um, what you can do with it is you can connect it and run my measurement firmware, um, which essentially there is, let me see, where is that? Um, Somewhere, somewhere I mentioned this. I think um, there are. Um, oh, I think I think maybe in the repository. Yeah, cool. So there is a single. There are a couple of buttons on the development board. There is a single button of them that we use, which is the switch three, and it's kind of like pressing a key. And when you press the switch three, it does a measurement and it starts a um, keyboard report that it sends to the computer, and then it looks at when the computer replies. So you kind of can measure the end-to-end -end latency um, of your input stack, including sort of the keyboard layer. Um, and then you can use that to measure the different programs uh, or parts of the stack that you have, right? You can measure the USB host controller, the Linux kernel, the input event API, um, graphical interfaces such as X11 or Wayland, um, actual end user programs such as Emacs, um, and then you can kind of put it all together. Um, and that's what I did here with the end-to-end -end latency chart. You can see the matrix scan is about 100 microseconds in the keyboard that I tested. USB pole is 125 microseconds as per the USB 2 high speed. Uh, Linux adds another 152 microseconds with its software um, to drive the USB host controller. Um, and then Emacs adds another 278 microseconds, which is actually like a really, really good value um, and in total, you have like 655 microseconds of latency between you pressing a physical key and Emacs showing that it has changed its text. And that is really great. Like that is really, really good uh, input latency. Um, so I know that there are other posts on the web that say, oh, computers these days are so terrible because their input latency is so terrible. Um, but it's not at all what I have reproduced here. Um, and I also want to show, um, not right now, but at some point, that you don't need to go to these extreme lengths of having your own keyboard, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to reach these typical latencies. So USB, Paul, Linux, and Emacs, these are going to be pretty much universal, you know, with some differences depending on the CPU speed of your computer and the, the specific hardware, etc., but ballpark, they're going to be the same across computers. Um, and uh, keyboards, actually, with a couple of smaller changes, um, can be pretty fast in general as well. Um, so anyway, input latency, um, we are very good um, in terms of input latency in this project. Um, and it was like a whole side quest of mine to like talk about input latency and figure it out. Um, yeah, sort of as, as a side quest in this whole keyboard saga. So um, circling back to, to what I want to do today, um, I have this new keyboard controller that I have been working on. I'm going to show you why. Um, but first, let's actually now open up a Kinesis keyboard. Um, and while I do that, uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, in the chat yet, or if there are any specific things that you want to see. Um, while I try to like get this camera into a into an okay position here. Um, cool. So. You see my work surface now. So let's pull up um, this keyboard right here. Um, this is an Advantage 2 LF. Um, yeah, there you can see it. Uh, so this is the newer vision. This is the KB600. Um, I chose to go with the um, Red Cherry MX. Um, because I wanted to try them out. I had tried them out in another keyboard, but I figured I might try them out here as well, just to see how they feel. Um, if I type something in here, um, it like you can kind of hear how it sounds to a certain extent. Um, you can compare this to my usual keyboard. We're gonna do a couple comparisons later on as well, um, but it's just not as satisfying. Like I, I really need the, the blue clicks. Um, so that's gonna be a thing that we're gonna modify about this keyboard here as well. Um, on stream, but not today. This is going to be a future session. Um, 
Hardware hacking is so cool. I really want to get into doing projects like this. Yeah, you are in luck. Um, uh, after today, I think you can totally start out. Did you use RTOs, etc., while writing the firmware? Um, depends on which one you mean. The one that I mentioned, the bare metal ones, um, I did not use a real-time operating system. I did it all like bare metal. Um, there was like an event, not an event loop even. There was just a main loop that would do keyboard scanning and then talk to the USB hardware on the microcontroller. Um, obviously, um, it's also more interesting to, to see what the latency is when you have a real-time operating system in the mix. Um, because that is something that many people like to do on keyboard controllers uh, for a good reason, I want to add. Um, and I did actually do some tests and it's not like a big slowdown, um, not even a measurable difference at all. Um, so I did measure the bare metal firmware that I had and then I measured the um, SDK based firmware that I had. So NXP comes with an SDK for the uh, microcontroller that the Teensy uses. And I just used their example hit device and modified it. Um, so that has like, you know, a driver abstraction, hardware abstraction layer, etc. cetera. Um, so there's some code in the mix there. Um, that does not play any role whatsoever in terms of input latency um, or, you know, um, other considerations. And also, um, even when you add real-time operating system, I think the NXP SDK supports free RTOS. Uh, and uh, yeah, still no measurable difference. So um, in the current firmware that I'm working on and that I'm going to show you today, um, it is based on a real-time operating system depending on which Teensy controller you're targeting. All right, long-winded answer. Um, let's actually open this up, right? So um, there, this, is, this is sort of what you see when you open it up, right? Um, you have this cable here, like obviously I, I did prepare this, right? So the cable would normally be plugged in. Um, it would be plugged in, let me put this to the side for a second. Um, it would be plugged into this little board here. Um, this is the original Kinesis controller board, um, let me, Hold it up here so you can see. Um, you can see that this is different from the one that I showed you earlier, right? Um, so first of all, you can see that all of the little parts here are actually SMD parts. Um, there is a lot less going on on this board. You can see that there is a controller here. Um, the, the biggest ICs, the biggest integrated circuits, um, the biggest black chips on your board are typically the processor, right? So this is an MCU, a microcontroller. It's an Atmel one. Um, and yeah, I, I want to do some more analysis on what they're doing here, but um, maybe at a later point. Um, doing our own thing is a little more interesting anyway, um, but it can't hurt to like, you know, know what you're dealing with, um, uh, with the standard controller as well. Um, the standard controller is actually kind of cool in the newer revision. Um, I think they did a couple of good changes to it. Um, so the cable that the keyboard has, it goes in here. So this is sort of their own little connector that they have here. Like it's not, Kinesis didn't invent this connector, but um, the pinout that they have, and they have actually documented it here now um, on the silk screen, like on the description of the board, if you will. Um, they didn't do that in the older revision. So it's pretty cool that in general, the silk screen of this newer um, Kinesis controller is much better than the older ones. Um, much nicer for if you want to know what's going on. Um, so this was uh, this was plugged in here, and then uh, the rest of these actually. Uh, let me swap this out. So this is sort of the underside of the keyboard of the keyboard case. This is not very interesting. Um, one thing that I still want to show you before I put this away is um, in here. You can see that the the cable has sort of like uh, this weird RJ11, I want to say, connector uh, that goes into um, additional hardware uh, that Kinesis offers. Uh, I think they have like a foot pedal that you can use um, if that's your thing. Um, and then aside from that, there's no other openings here on that case. This is different with the older keyboards um, and I'm going to show you later. But let's actually move uh, to the more interesting part of the keyboard. So in here, uh, it originally comes like this, right? Originally, it has the original keyboard controller in it. Um, and then you can see that uh, this is sort of you know, just the underside of what you've seen before and what you can still see here on my main keyboard. Uh, let me do it like this, yeah. Um, cool, so uh, in here you can see like the right keypad, you can see the right thumb pad, the left thumb pad, the left keypad, um, and then, and this is the upgrade that I was mentioning earlier, uh, the KB600, the newer ones actually has like the F function key row here, which is also now a proper PCB and it has proper mechanical switches on it. Um, and they are much nicer to press. 
like if you if you push one of these down, much much more satisfying. Um, no longer wobbling around, much better. All right, um, so you can see here on the original board that they all plug into these um, FPC connectors here. Um, I think it's like oh, I don't want to I don't want to give you a wrong description of the acronym, but I think the F stands for flat because you know the the, the cables or flex. I don't know. Huh, you can look it up. Um, anyway, they have like these six connectors here, um, one for each PCB that is in there, right? So. Conceptually, the, this is very simple. Um, it used to be a little bit different. So let me show you the difference. Ugh. All right, uh, so older keyboard. Um, very similar, right? You still have the left and the right uh, key well, you have the thumb pads, but uh, one difference you can see is that the, uh, oh, can you see? You can see here. Yeah, so the thumb pads here, the connector that they have is not the same FPC one that they have up here. They just have like this cable here, which used to be soldered onto the Kinesis keyboard controller. So in order for this keyboard to be modified, and I don't know if you can see this all that well. Yeah, um, here, you can see that I had to kind of like strip the ends open of this cable and then solder it um, to a header. Um, which I connected onto the board so that I can actually like, you know, just remove this one and remove that one and that way exchange the keyboard controller without having to desolder all of these because it's really a pain to desolder them. Um, anyway, in the newer revisions, they switched to, uh, to FPC connectors for everything, which is a really good choice. Um, I really like that. And then in the old revision, uh, this is the uh, function key sort of background. Yeah, that I was talking about. You can really see the traces on here um, and the matrix, right? It's kind of cool that this uh, FPC cable that they have here is transparent um, and that you can kind of infer what's going on there. But uh, the experience is really bad, right? The, the function keys, um, as, I, as I showed you before, like these are not satisfying to press at all. All right, um, so that's the old keyboard. Let's go back to the new one. Um, did you try using some kind of wireless communication with the computer? No, I don't like wireless for things that can be wired. Um, there is an appeal in wireless uh, accessories such as wireless headphones, I think. Um, I enjoy them because the cable is really annoying for headphones. But uh, in particular for keyboards, there's also security risk um, of transmitting all of your keystrokes through the air. Um, I just don't want to have that risk um, and I do prefer if my keyboard uh, is one of the devices where I don't have to care about batteries and charging etc etc um, so not a wireless person uh, when I can avoid it okay um, so um, let's assume that you bought this new Kinesis keyboard or you know for some reason you got a hold of it um, maybe you got it for free from a friend um, maybe it was uh, broken and you got it from the trash uh, you would be surprised how many keyboards I got from the trash <laughs> Um, if you work in a big company, it can be good to just ask around um, on your internal mailing lists or, uh, you know, at, at a social gathering of sorts. Um, just be like, you know, do you know of anybody who uses these weird Kinesis keyboards? And does anyone have one that they don't want anymore or that is broken? And maybe you'll find one for free. Um, this has worked for me multiple times in the past. So, you know, <laughs> um, they're also available on eBay um, if you want them for cheap. They're used on eBay, also good. Um, However, um, if you get a defective one, it goes without saying that you'll need to fix it up, right? So uh, depending on what is broken, uh, the fix might be easy. Usually for all of the ones that I've had, uh, for all of the defective ones that I got, it was always a controller problem. So you could totally fix the keyboard up by just inserting your own keyboard controller. So one of the use cases for having your own keyboard controller might just be to fix a defective keyboard. Another one might be if you wanna work around a bug that you encounter. Now, I think the newer controller doesn't have any known bugs right now, maybe. Um, maybe you know differently, let me know in the chat. Um, but maybe there is gonna be a bug at some point. Or, um, you know, maybe fixing bugs isn't your jam, but maybe you want these custom features and this custom firmware, right? Maybe you want to change um, how your keyboard looks like and behaves. Maybe you wanna split it, like I mentioned earlier. Maybe, you know, for traveling, it would be good to build a split keyboard. You could totally do that if you had your own keyboard controller in there. Um, some people like to add LEDs, some people like to use weird layouts, some people like to remap their layouts in hardware. 
other people just like that they're tinkering with something um, on, uh, yet other people enjoy running open source software on all of their devices, including their keyboards. Uh, I've been using my Advantage 2 for three-ish years and haven't hit any bugs, but I'm super curious anyway. Yeah, um, there is a, another reason which might be uh, input latency. I have read from somebody that on their Advantage 2, they feel like it is sluggish. I haven't yet measured the Advantage 2 with its original controller. So I can't confirm that the person is right. But uh, you know, if it turns out that the input latency is not great on the original controller, um, we certainly can fix it with a custom controller. So um, long story short, there's many different reasons why you would want to ch exchange your controller. Um, you know, Maybe it's appealing to you, maybe not. Um, maybe you need to do it, maybe you want to. Anyway, um, for, for the rest of the stream, let's just assume that you want to for some reason. Um, and then um, what I have here is uh, a package from Oshpark. Um, this, received, this I received yesterday, um, and what it contains is the latest revision of my keyboard controller. So let me walk through uh, what this keyboard controller does um, and what are some notable features. Uh, let me actually put it down here. Um, yeah, let me rearrange this a little bit. Do some light here, move this there. Maybe like this, all right. Um, cool, yeah, that seems okay. Um, great silk screen, yeah, thanks. Um, actually, you know what? Um, so, yeah, I need to sign in for this. Why am I not signed in anymore? Yeah, let me see, does this actually work? This one doesn't seem to work. Ugh, that is annoying. Um, I thought I set this up. Give me just a sec. Um, I'm gonna try to fix this. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Uh, still using a separate X session deal for streaming. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me see if I can make it work with my portable security key. It looks like, no. Yeah, queuing music, that would be something, huh? Um, you'll need to do your own music. Maybe you can post a link in the, in the chat. <laughs> um, let me try the, uh, let me try the uh, two-factor code. Do I have that set up even? And if no, I'll use a recovery code. We will make it work somehow but I really want to show you the new assets. Um, I don't have this set up. Let me use recovery code. Ah, uh, yeah, so um, it turns out that KeePass actually, um, the I was using uh, KeePass one database um, one second. Yeah, I was using a KeePass one database for the longest time with the KP CLI tool. Um, and uh, it broke recently when I updated my Perl version. That of course is really, really annoying um, because now I need to use a different, um, let me see. Cool, okay, logged in. Um, cool, okay, now I can actually also show it. Uh, so let me actually close this again. Yeah, so now I need to use like a different um, KeePass client, which is annoying um, because it requires me to upgrade my KeePass database, but I wanna go back to KPCLI. So um, yeah, if, if anyone else is also using KPCLI, uh, 
on Arch Linux and has it working with the latest updates, let me know how you did it because maybe I'm just holding it wrong. So anyway, this is the um, repository for my latest keyboard controller and um, I will set this to public um, after the stream. But um, for now, let me show you the render of the front and backs. Uh, back. So the front and back is you know kind of a weird concept in this particular board because, um, let me switch to this view, yeah. Um, because this is the front side, um, but because the keyboard, um, you know, it, it goes on kind of like, it, it goes into the keyboard. Uh, let, me, let me show it to you like this. Yeah, uh, it goes into the keyboard like this, right? Like facing you. So the side on which you actually put in the keyboard controller is the back side of the PCB. Um, so that's a little bit confusing, um, but you kind of get used to it. So let's switch back to the high resolution renderings. Um, wait, why did I, oh, I did already open this. Cool, go back here. So we have back and front. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so you already mentioned that the uh, silk screen looks great and I'm happy that you say that because uh, really a lot of work went into the silk screen. Um, one thing that you can see here right away is that, um, uh, first of all, a big version number on there um, and a bunch of metadata, right? On the old keyboard controller, it was kind of hard um, to know, you know, if you, if you just found that PCB on somebody's attic, you wouldn't really know what to do with it. Um, you know, ideally it would already be in a keyboard and work, but uh, maybe not, or maybe it is in a keyboard and it doesn't work anymore and you want to figure out what it is. It wasn't clear with the old board. Um, let me actually see if I have an old board here. Um, I think, yeah, um, I think this might be the oldest that I still have here. Um, yeah, so this is like the front of the old uh, layout. You can see that it is labeled, so it says Teensy++ keyboard controller. But aside from that, there's nothing going on on the silk screen here. Um, no URL, no license. Um, the authors and the date is on there, so it's not terrible, but this silk screen I'm a lot happier with. Um, all right, let's switch back to the render. Um, okay, so We've already talked about the um, the connectors here, right? So you can see that really the most important parts of this keyboard controller are the connectors. Uh, you want to interface with all of the PCBs that are in your keyboard. So you can kind of think of this board as a breakout board. It is like a breakout board for the Kinesis keyboard for your Teensy microcontroller. And uh, in this particular revision, I wanted to leave people the freedom to use any sort of Teensy version that they had. Um, the old design was only for the Teensy++. Uh, this had various reasons. Uh, one reason was that the Teensy++ was the latest available Teensy at the time, so uh, that was already the high-end option. But um, the other constraint was that the firmware was only tested on the Teensy++. Uh, it didn't actually work, like you couldn't actually easily port it to other uh, Teensy versions. So over the year, um, more Teensy versions were released. Um, I actually have this um, handy compatibility chart here where um, the Teensy++ is sort of the oldest, then they released the 3.0, which is uh, deprecated by now, you should no longer use it, 3.1, the LC, 3.2, 3.5, 3.6, 4.0, 4.1, .4 .1, and that's where we are right now. So that's the latest, uh, that's the latest Teensy. Um, and uh, so what you can see here from the silk screen is that this keyboard controller is actually meant to be compatible with all of the different Teensy versions. You can plug in the Teensy++ if you want to have the same setup, like if you still have a couple of spare controls lying around or if you just prefer the old Teensy, maybe because you, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're familiar with the Atmel microcontrollers and you don't want to switch to ARM. Or maybe you want to put in the newest Teensy microcontroller um, and then you can do that. Or maybe you want to put in uh, the one that you have left over from another project. Or maybe you have like a very specific opinion about where you come down on the performance versus price chart. Um, maybe, for example, you would want to build the, 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 the lowest cost option, the Teensy LC, which I think stands for low cost, but I didn't see it spelled out anywhere, actually. Um, anyway, you could totally buy this. Um, you would not be able to drive any LEDs on the keyboard controller except for the caps lock LED. Caps lock is always connected with all of the Teensies in all of the versions, 
because it's the most important LED. If you want or need the other LEDs, you need to use a Teensy that has enough GPIO pins. That would restrict you to the 3.5, 3.6, and 4.1, or the older Teensy++. Um, that's sort of the consideration you can make here. And then within the Teensies, you can also say, well, this one costs $24, uh, this one costs $26, this one costs $29. Um, but if you look at the performance, maybe you would say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go with like the most recent Teensy that has enough pins for all LEDs um, and is the cheapest option for me, right? Um, or maybe you're like, uh, extremely obsessed uh, with input latency like I am and the USB 1.1 is not enough for you and you say, well, I need USB 2.0, then you must use the Teensy 4.1, for which, by the way, the software isn't finished yet. So that just as a caveat, but there are a couple of combinations that are tested and verified and work. Um, notably, the, the old configuration still works and is still available. It's just this board should be very future-proof. Um, because it is very unlikely that all of these Teensies will all be out of stock at the same time. Um, so, you know, whatever the future of the Teensies holds for us, I think we should have an easy time upgrading this design um, to any changes that we need to make. Um, is there a reason to have those empty spaces, maybe related to cables from other cards, I'm asking as PCB manufacturers charge with the area of the board? Yeah. Um, you will see, um, actually, when I when I hold this um, onto the keyboard, um, but let me let me quickly explain to you based on the render. So you see this hole right here, like the bottom hole that is gold plated. Um, that's the primary mounting hole. Through this one, you put a screw. Um, I'll show you in the cam in just a sec. Then you have the top hole here, which is just a cutout. But through the cutout goes a plastic part which then takes a screw from the other side of the case. So that's sort of the secondary mounting hole. Then you have these cutouts here in the left and in the right places, um, where there's additional little plastic knobs that go through the board to additionally hold it in place. So if you want like the most stable board in your Kinesis, you will need to at least make it as wide as these two cutouts, right? If you just want to mechanically fit into the keyboard as well as possible. And then, uh, the connectors here, like you could conceivably move this this one, the J7, under the cutout, but then you put more strain on the cable. Um, let me actually switch to cam view and show this to you. Uh, let me change this just ever so slightly and then switch here. Um, so in here, actually, let me see if this works. Yeah, cool. Um, here, you can see the primary mounting hole with the screw going through it. Here is where the plastic thing goes through the board. Um, here are the two cutouts um, with the plastic knobs. Um, yeah, you can see it if I remove my finger uh, with the plastic knobs going through. Um, and then you can kind of look at the length of the cables that are in the keyboard already um, and in which position you should put the connectors. So in particular, if you look, for example, uh, let me see. Yeah, cool. Um, if you look at this one, the idea is that um, this is the bit that you cannot change, right? So the cable goes out of this and it goes like in a straight line over to here. So this position of the connector is kind of mandated if you want to release or relieve as much strain off of the cables as possible. You could totally move this connector like up here, right? But then your cable would be super strained, hard to get in, hard to pull out. Um, maybe there'll be a disconnect as you use your keyboard. Um, maybe you will break it while traveling, etc. So um, I wanted to make it so that this would be like a very robust keyboard controller. Um, and for that, you need a certain size. Now, if you actually looked very closely just a second ago, um, as I was dealing with these two designs, you can actually see that um, the old keyboard controller is actually larger than the new one. Um, this is because the old one was using the same measurements as the older Kinesis controller, and then the new one is using similar measurements as the latest Kinesis keyboard controller. You can see it's still a little bit wider, but I feel like my connector positions have like a little bit less strain on the cables. Um, longer flex cables might be cheaper, maybe. Ooh, I don't know about this. Um, I found it hard to get any of this. Um, I mean, it's possible to get these flex cables, but it's not like you have a huge selection of them. Um, 
So you can see that I've already conserved some space and this actually has made the PCB cheaper to manufacture. But at that point, we're only talking a few dollars now, right? Like if you manage to squeeze a couple of millimeters off of it, um, maybe you can save like, you know, base on, on a, let me actually switch back uh, and show this to you on the repository view. Um, yeah, we have 72 US dollars for three boards at Osh Park with the current size. The old size cost 81 US dollars for three boards. Um, so it's just a couple of bucks per board um, and you need to have a certain size. So I'm trying to make it small, but I'm not overly obsessed with making it the absolute smallest it can be um, because doing it this way, like it also gives us a little bit more leeway, right? Like we don't need to make sure that um, the PCB is perfectly manufactured. Um, we can, for example, uh, prototype these PCBs at home if we have like a home lab or if you make PCBs from scratch as a hobby. Um, you can totally do that easily with the, the way the traces are laid out here. Um, there's only a few vias that I'm using. Um, there's nothing special on the PCB going on. It should be easy to hand fix, like the spacing is good. Like I was trying to, to make much, uh, as much use of the resources and of the space that I have here as possible. Um, I think that's a, a fair trade-off to make. All right, um, so we were talking about um, how all of the different teensies can be connected here. Um, and then that we have all of these connectors. Um, one more notable thing, um, well, maybe you might be wondering about this space here. Um, this is for adding your own notes. Um, you might have seen it on cam that I had actually, um, if I switch back here, I have actually scribbled uh, def plus plus into the notes field here. Um, this is so that if you have multiple builds of keyboard controllers, you can sort of keep them apart. Uh, you can say, oh yeah, this is my dev board for that purpose, or this is the board that I built then and then. Um, or, you know, if, if you had to manually fix up something, or if you need to put a revision number or whatever you want to put there, I found that whenever you have some silk screen available on a board, it is nice to fill it with a blank field so that you can make your own notes on the board. And then right below this uh, silk screen note field here, you have the uh, KB600 or KB500 description here. And this is because the keyboard controller is made to be compatible with both the old and the new version. So you can choose to either solder in the pin header here for the older version or the FPC connector for the newer version or both if you want to use the same board for both uh, keyboards. Maybe you currently have a KB500 but you're looking to upgrade to a KB600 or maybe you know, you'll know you get a KB600 at some point and then it might be nice to update. Um, that's the connectors on this side. Let's have a quick look on the other side before we go into more details. So on here, you can see that um, there are a couple of uh, solder jumpers here. Um, these are for compatibility with the Teensy++. And I can explain in a little bit why that is. And aside from that, the only parts that need to be put on the front side of this board are the LEDs. Uh, you can see that they're labeled here. There's caps lock at the very left. This is the one that is always connected. And then we have numlock, scroll lock, and keypad. These are the ones for which you need the TNZ controllers that have enough GPIO ports. Cool. Um, you can see that I have labeled these very, very extensively. Like uh, the anode and cathode is labeled, the symbol is on there, and the marker is on there because I always get the LEDs wrong or I'm always unsure which way they go in. Um, so the rule of thumb uh, to, to kind of remember this with this particular board is that if your LED has any sort of marker, like in the physical LED, uh, it goes on here where the marker is. So that would be the cathode side, which is the one that is always marked. Um, so, you know, when, when you have an LED and you have the board in front of you, there should be no doubt about which way it goes in. Uh, it is one of the few directional parts uh, in, in this design. Um, all of the rest is just super simple solder points, which is why I'm saying that this is such a great project for beginners. All right, um, so um, if you have not worked with the Teensy before, let me show you a little thing, um, which is um, these very recognizable and typical uh, introduction cards that come with each purchase of a Teensy. So they have sort of the whole pinout on them. Uh, and you can see that there are a couple of, um, let me hold this up. There are a couple of different colors and layers of alternate functions on these pins. But then there are also these numbers. Like you can see that here, 
uh, from ground, it starts numbering the pins as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up until 12. Uh, and then on the other side, it has 13 to 23. And that is sort of the minimum uh, pinout that every Teensy has. Um, you can see that on the board, um, on the silk screen, we have the pins labeled uh, the very same way. So you can very easily compare between the Teensy instructions um, and the board here. Like uh, if, you, if you need to measure pin seven, for example, you can very easily find pin seven here, both uh, on the back side where you actually put the microcontroller and on the front side, um, there should be like debugging should be very simple here. Um, so I'm, I'm walking you through every detail of this board here because I think there's a little bit to learn in each of the details um, and there's a little bit to appreciate in each of the details. Um, so maybe you can use this for your own projects. Um, so that's why I'm spending so much time here. Um, cool. So let me actually switch to my uh, desktop view and then go through this. So we've talked about how it supports both of the keyboards. It is made for the Teensy 3.x and 4.x series, which should be future-proof. It is smaller and cheaper. The silk screen is much more clear. Um, let's take a look at the schematic right after. A um, couple meta points as well. The new keyboard controller is actually done in KiCad. It used to be done in Eagle, uh, which was the tool that all of my friends were using back in 2013. Um, so that's why I started with it. But then I switched to KiCad, which can actually just import the Eagle design. And then I use that for any further development. Um, because also Eagle is uh, not open source software and it does cost license fees and it does uh, use a subscription model at this point. So you can't even no longer use an older version of Eagle that you still have lying around or that you have a student license for or something like that. Um, so it was really good to move to KiCad uh, because it removes that barrier. So if anyone wants to change anything about this design, uh, you're very welcome to and it should be very easy. Um, then on the old board, uh, the Teensy had to be soldered on upside down, which was always a bit awkward. Um, on the new one, this is no longer the case, and I'm going to show you how to solder these uh, ideally um, later in the stream. Um, so once we do like you know, once we have all of the all of the new keyboard controller hardware out of the way, um, and I, I'm going to show you the software, um, we're actually going to build one together. Um, and you know, we have plenty of time for questions and answers in between if there's anything that really interests you or if you want to steer the direction of what we are going to be talking about. Um, then the, the FPC connectors, we've already talked about me moving them for less strain on the cables. Um, oh yeah, and then the, the special LED thing. Uh, if, you, if you can live without scroll lock, num lock, and keypad, you can build uh, very cheap builds of this. Uh, we also talked a little bit about which Teensy controller to use. I showed you the chart here. Um, and then uh, let's actually quickly go over what this costs actually. Um, I'm gonna publish the Oshpark project link um, where you can just buy the board uh, for $72 for three boards. Um, there might be shipping on this as well and possibly import charges depending on where you live in the world and you know how much money you end up spending actually, um, like how many boards you buy. But um, you need to buy a minimum of three if you wanna buy at Oshpark. There are other PCB manufacturers, but most of them have a minimum quantity of three. At least some of them have a minimum quantity of five. So it makes sense to do group orders of these, or if you have many keyboards you want to switch, uh, then you know maybe just buy a couple of boards. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of material, the, the bill of materials, the BOM, um, or you know the parts list, if you want the component list, um, let's go through it. So you have a Teensy microcontroller. Um, if you choose the 3.6 version, you're going to end up spending $32 on a Teensy, but you can just choose any, right? We talked about this. Then um, you have, you know, just a generic pin header here. Um, this is uh, the pin header. Yeah, you've probably seen one like these, right? Even if you don't do electronics. Um, the site that I'm linking to here is called Octopart. It's like a really cool site. Um, they have an API as well. It's sort of uh, an aggregator where um, you can see all of the different distributors. Um, there are a couple of different big electronics distributors that you will undoubtedly come across if you do any sort of electronics. Uh, DigiKey is one of them. Uh, Farnell, RS Components, and Mauser are other big names. Uh, you can see that they have uh, immense stock qualities of certain parts um, and good prices. Uh, the selection is similar-ish. Um, between the different distributors, I have paid attention in this particular project to only use parts that are available at multiple distributors. So there's no like bottleneck or no constraint. Um, you don't need to do your own shopping for this. 
um, you can actually just click on the Octopart Bomb tool, which is a super cool idea. Um, and in this tool, um, all of the parts that you need are already saved. And uh, you can just click somewhere. I don't see where. Do I need to log in or is it on the right? Oh, here. Yeah, um, preferred distributors. You can just click buy now on DigiKey or buy now on Mouser, and then you'll just get like a filled in cart and you can just order it. So super simple to order the components that you need for one build of these. Um, let's go through, through in more detail what they are. So um, for the Teensy, you'll need a couple of pin headers to mount it on the board. I'm gonna show you how that's gonna work. Um, you'll need two additional ones for the KB500, where we use the pin headers for connecting the thumb pads as well. If you build for the KB600 only, you can remove uh, two of them. You can buy only five of them if you want um, and you know, save a couple cents here. Um, then you need the uh, Molex connectors. These are the FPC connectors. Uh, says so right here. Uh, let me show you a picture. Oh, this is not a great picture. Yeah. The pinout is not great. Uh, yeah, let me actually, let's see, do I have them here? Yeah. Uh, let me show you how this looks. So when you buy them on DigiKey, um, this is what you'll get. Uh, you'll get this like little plastic baggie. Um, it has this uh, characteristic DigiKey label. Inside, um, there's like bubble wrap. And then in here, uh, I did buy more than just a couple because I use a lot of them <laughs> lately. Um, and then you have like, uh, let me put this out of the way, show you. Okay, so these are the connectors. Uh, there you go. This is what it looks like. If I rotate it slowly. Yeah, so you can see it has 13 pins. Um, if I plug this in here, uh, you can see it, um, oh, sorry, uh, here you can see, this is what it looks like. So it goes right through um, and you can open it up by sort of gently pulling it up. And then when you insert the cable, you would push it down um, and then the cable is locked. Um, that's how these FPC connectors work. All right, I'm gonna put these back into the bag. Um, and also actually this one here goes back to the Oshpark um, bag. Uh, somebody's saying uh, <laughs> Digi Key unboxing stream. That's what this is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all the things, you get all of it. You get the unboxing, the soldering, the designing, the uh, open sourcing, etc. all of it. Um, for PCB, I think JLPCB is the cheapest nowadays. Uh, that might be true. I have heard from JLCPCB um, before. Um, some people seem to like it. Um, I myself like to order from Oshpark uh, for a couple of different reasons. So first of all, um, oh, let's see, where do they have it? Oh, they don't have it on here. Oh, that's, that's too bad. Um, they have this super cool slogan. Oh, there it is because their slogan is producing perfect purple PCBs promptly. And you know, if, if that is not the greatest alliteration ever in PCB manufacturing, I don't know what is. Uh, and um, sorry, let me just put this away. Um, we're gonna need some later, but not right now. Cool. So. Um, I mean, I just like the, the color of the PCBs, right? Like the, the purple PCBs, it's great. Um, but more seriously, um, at Oshpark, uh, as you can see, you can just drag and drop your KiCad Eagle or zip Gerber files for upload. Uh, in, in, uh, in Hobby Electronics, um, there are a couple of ways that you interface with your PCB manufacturer. Uh, so in the olden days, uh, Gerber files were sort of the standard. So you would sort of export from your CAD program to Gerber, um, and then you would send that to your um, PCB fab, and then they would import it into their tools, which would be something like you know a, a, a mill or a drill or uh, you know the the via makers or whatever you have there, um, and they would process each layer right um, in in separate files even. So this would just be like similar to like a bitmap graphic, if you will. Um, and then the tool would interpret, um, actually, let me let me actually make this a, like a lot more concrete for you. Um, 
One thing that we're gonna do, and I think this should work because, uh, sorry, on this desktop. Hope this works. Cool. All right. Um, I don't know if I need to be logged in for this. I, I don't think I need to be. Uh, sorry. Wow, this is this is terrible. What's happening here? Oh, there you go. Um, T. All right. If we just put the keycap PCB in here, um, so this is much better. Um, the, the the more the preferable interface for me is not having to ever do anything with any Gerber files whatsoever, because there are export parameters and you can get them wrong, and there are certain subtleties about different fabs and PCB manufacturers. Um, and uh, it is just like, is, is bringing so much uncertainty into your process to use a Gabber export if you're not familiar with how this works and if you're not willing to do a couple of iterations. So uh, any service where you can just upload a keycat file is so much more safe for beginners to manufacture a PCB at. And Oshpark was one of them that I had heard good things of. Um, they have a couple of other cool cool things as well, but let me just show you. Um, so I just plugged the PCB, the keycap PCB file into Oshpark. You can see that it rendered the top and the bottom layers. But if I now go to continue, you can see. Oh, sorry. Um, I need to add an email address. Uh, <laughs> let's see if they're happy with this. All right. <laughs> um, so the board top, the board bottom, so far so good. So this is the drill layer. Um, this would be a Gerber file typically. I mean, th this is what, what uh, Oshpark is doing, right? They're, they are programmatically using KiCad to export Gerber files. Um, it's just, they have all the settings correct and they, they know what to look out for. So when they do it, it's gonna come out correct. Um, then you have the bottom solder mask layer, uh, board outline layer, um, uh, this is so that they know how big it is, etc. Um, when they do the panelization, the silk screen itself, um, top solder mask, top layer. Um, this is where you can see all of the traces, uh, different silk screens, and different different layers uh, for bottom as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much all the layers there are in this particular design. Um, and you know, in in the Gerber's uh, in the Gerber workflow, you would have exported them all, and then hopefully uh, correctly, and then hopefully. Your, your service would be happy. But I just like doing doing Oshpark also um, because um, they have uh, a super swift prototyping service, which is very cool. So uh, the pricing is pretty much double what you would pay for a regular PCB. So if you have a small PCB, um, you know, that just costs you a couple of dollars. Um, I have such, uh, such a PCB actually because I'm working on an adapter board uh, for KB500 to KB600, if you have an existing keyboard controller, um, you would be able to use that board and hook up a newer keyboard to it uh, without having to do anything else or spend any other money. So um, that's like a little side project that I'm making here. Um, that just costs a couple bucks. I think, let's say it costs five bucks. So Super Swift would be 10 bucks um, plus shipping, but um, the turnaround time is much, much faster. Uh, I have had a turnaround time where I had ordered from uh, Oshpark on a Tuesday evening, my time zone, and I had the board in my mailbox on the coming Monday, so in six days, um, which is kind of amazing considering that Oshpark is, uh, I think in Portland, uh, USA, um, and I am in Zurich in Switzerland. So just the fact that they can ship it so quickly using UPS is amazing. And then that they can send it to the fab, get it back from the fab, de-panel it and ship it in time is, yeah, mind blowing. Um, I don't know of any service where you could get this fast a turnaround time. Um, obviously it is very expensive, but if you're willing to spend the money because you're super impatient and you just want to iterate quickly on a hobby electronics project, this is a super cool service. And also um, Oshpark is very approachable. So if you ever have any questions on your PCBs, like uh, if, if, for example, for the, for the um, adapter board that I'm making, um, I need two different sides of it. Um, I need like uh, the um, if you if, let me hold this into the camera. I like I need the the left connector and the right connector, um, and I want both of them to be in the same design because it doesn't make sense that you would need to buy three left connectors and three right connectors. You should just buy three connector sets and then get all of what you need. Um, costs less money. It's easier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for that, you need to sort of break your PCB in the middle. Um, so how do you do it? Um, 
turns out there's a couple of different ways. Um, the, the keyword here is panelization. Um, if you want to look it up and find all of the different techniques, um, let me actually panelize PCB. Let's see if we can find a quick image of how this would look like. Mm hmm, right, maybe this one, kinda. Or maybe not. No, this is not what I mean. Um, panelization PCB Oshpart, maybe. Yeah, this looks better. Um, this is what I meant. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So um, this is sort of where you would break off these PCBs, right? So you have like one large PCB and then in there you have these spaces and that way you manufacture like in this case, three smaller boards. In my case, two smaller boards. Uh, and then you could have these um, so-called mouse bites here um, where you know you just have a couple of holes and then like this little uh, you know, hold together uh, connection in the middle. And I had a question about this because I couldn't quite figure out how I would do it best in KiCad. And I approached the support and they gave me actually a much better advice, uh, which is that um, if you just want to cut these together, uh, sorry, if you just want to cut these apart, uh, you can just mark that in the outline. Like you can just, in your one design, you can just draw two little boards and then uh, Oshpark will do the rest for you. So that is like the easiest way. And the, the support was very approachable in this, um, uh, explained it uh, in, in detail and also gave me a couple of other options if that wouldn't be good. Um, so I'm very happy with, with uh, Oshpark in general, uh, with the turnaround times, with the quality, impeccable quality every time. I've never had like a PCB that was defective. Um, and yeah, very good folks. Um, also seem to support open source a lot, um, open hardware. Yeah, I, I strongly recommend Oshpark. Um, if you don't have any preferences, use Oshpark. Um, and then you're asking vGroove, um, what's that? Is, is Groove another uh, manufacturer? Let me know, clarify the question, please. Cool, um, let me see where we need to back up to. So, Oshpark turnaround times, Molex connector, cool. Yeah, let's go back uh, to here and then go through the rest of the bill of materials. So, we've had the connectors and then there's only two more parts. Uh, the King Bright LEDs, um, any LED will work. If you don't like blue LEDs, choose your color. You can use green LEDs. Um, you can use RGB LEDs for what I care, you know, if, if that's your thing. Um, and then you need a resistor uh, in front of the LED um, to determine the brightness. Uh, by default, they will be much too bright. You'll need to really dim them down. Um, 10K is uh, a good value for a resistor if you need them. Um, Oh, B-Groove is a PCP paneling technique. Okay, um, I, I have no idea. I actually haven't done panelization myself ever. Um, the adapter board is the first one where I really use it um, and I have yet to receive it. So can't say much about panelization in general except from saying what it is. Um, yeah, so then you have the resistor here. Um, I found that 10K is a good value if you want it uh, even darker, um, even, even dimmer or even brighter. Uh, you can play around with the resistor value here. But you can see that this is a very simple project, right? You have the microcontroller in the middle, you have the connectors uh, for the microcontroller, you have the connectors for the PCBs, and you have four LEDs done, right? Like, really, this is a, this is a simple electronics project. Um, all of the parts, um, there's no need to get the specific version except for the Molex connector, right? Because this is where you interface with the uh, PCBs on the Kinesis. So this is where you really wanna have like the proper connector. But for everything else, you can kind of wing it, right? If you have any SMD LEDs lying around that you know will work, just put them in. If you have any spare resistors, put them in. If you have uh, pin headers lying around, the chances are very high, they will work. If you have an old Teensy lying around, that will work. This project is very forgiving. Um, I like that about it. Cool, um, and then the next bit is the soldering instructions. But I think we're gonna um, do the soldering a little bit later. And first I wanna take a little detour to the software. Um, do you have any any questions about the hardware at all? Oh, actually, um, we haven't looked at the schematic yet. I want to show you the schematic real quick, um, and then we can go back to it. Let me actually see if I can download this and open it up here. That would be better. Um, we can go back to this later also. So uh, let me full screen this. Cool. Okay, so this is the whole schematic. Um, for those of you who are not like an expert in electronics, uh, this might look a little scary? I don't know. Um, it's very simple uh, in, in general for a schematic, but what it tries to show you is how things are wired up, right? This is sort of the logical representation of what is going on in this design. Um, so let's start actually with the LEDs because they're so simple, right? 
you have uh, the, the 3V3 here represents a 3.3 volt power supply. That's going into the LEDs on one end. Uh, you have the, the resistors, um, and then you have a signal called LED keypad. You can see that LED keypad is a signal that then goes directly into the microcontroller here. So essentially, um, we're just using this whole schematic as sort of like a pinout documentation. Um, but we're also using it actually to route our tracks so we can be sure that it is correct. Um, I have spent some time to make this piece uh, to make this schematic nice and presentable. You can see that there's like a lot of segmentation going on. There's like spacing, alignment, uh, you know, a filled in title card here uh, with all of the right uh, dates and details, etc. Um, but let me go over a couple of things um, to make them clear. So. Here you can see how we connect to the Teensy pins. Like you can see the numbering is the same that we used earlier uh, on the silk screen and also on the Teensy uh, welcome card that we had. Uh, you can see that we have the row symbols, uh, sorry, the row signals and the column signals. Uh, we can talk about how a keyboard matrix works later. Um, it's also explained in the QMK documentation if you're curious. Um, and then we have the LED signals and you can already see there's this um, compartmentalization going on here. So we have this area, which is only present on the Teensy++, and then the even bigger square is sort of what's only present on the bigger Teensies of the later revisions. So um, sort of anything that is not uh, inside here is available on all of the different Teensies, and the rest is specific to a different, uh, to an individual Teensy revision, so to say. Um, and then we have the um, connectors for top right, right, uh, and thumb right. Um, on this side, and then thumb right also for the KB600 series, and then top left, left, and thumb left, and thumb left for the KB600 series for the other side, um, and that's all of the all of the things that we have in our schematic. Um, you can see on here that there are two different wirings. So the pinout that the Kinesis keyboard has, you can't really change it, but you can do like one or two subtle tweaks. Um, and uh, David Whetstone from Humble Hacker did this. Uh, he actually changed uh, column zero and column two, um, and column two and column one, and column one and column zero on here of like the top uh, top left keypad, and that makes the matrix a little bit nicer to handle. It saves one GPIO pin on the TNZ by making the matrix a little bit more compact. So this is like a really nice little hack because it doesn't involve doing any sort of hardware modifications. It just changes how we interpret um, what's on the pins. Um, but I wanted to be clear and also show you the original matrix wiring as Kinesis did it. So that's on the, on the schematic here in blue. And then you can compare it to what we are using based on the Humble Hacker work. Um, and you can see in bold are any differences. So they're easy to spot. There's a couple of differences here in the thumb pads as well. So the thumb pads and the F pads are uh, only the left F pad actually um, are what David changed. Um, and then the rest here, like the, the key wells themselves are unchanged because they're already efficient. Yeah, so that's the schematic. Um, now you've seen a schematic if you haven't seen one before. Um, cool. Um, any questions up until here? Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground, um, but let's actually dive into the software um, as the next topic. Let me actually rehydrate. This is cool, yeah, uh, glad you like it. There's more to come, um, more cool stuff to happen here. Uh, all right, uh, so QMK. Uh, QMK stands for Quantum Mechanical Keyboard Firmware. Um, this is a very popular firmware project. Uh, when I started out with uh, the keyboard hacking stuff, I just used the Humble Hacker firmware. Um, there was not really like a keyboard firmware scene or a keyboard hacking scene in general that is as large as it is today. But time has shown that uh, QMK is a very, very popular firmware. You can see it in the metrics here. It has 14,000 forks on GitHub. It has 380 contributions, uh, different contributors actually. Um, it's versioned properly. <laughs> it has a failing build apparently. Eh. Um, it is well documented, it is very extensive. Um, it has become clear to me that using a, you know, using QMK as one of the popular firmwares is actually just the right way forward because uh, people will add support for uh, for a keyboard controller that is popular to QMK without you wanting or doing anything. 
So at some point, I realized that somebody had actually added my original keyboard controller to QMK. Um, that was actually pretty cool. Um, so I had actually given it a shot recently and tried it out, and I was actually pleasantly surprised. Like building QMK is, is, is very neat. Configuring it is very cool. Uh, it has this online configurator, um, which I can just open up here. Uh, you can just like in here in keyboard, you can just type kinesis slash Stapleberg, um, have your layout and then define a custom key map, right? Say this is mine. Uh, you can modify the key map um, in here. Like you could say something like uh, the escape key and the delete key. What? Oh, now I unmapped delete. Um, I think there's also, uh, yeah, like you can, you can use uh, which caps you have in the configurator. Um, oh, and then the different layers are configurable too. Like this is, this is insanely polished. Like if I were to make my own firmware, I would not be able to do all of this, right? So if we can reuse QMK, that's a definite win. And all my work is now based on QMK. Um, so, you know, if you're into keyboard hacking in general, definitely recommend give QMK a look. Uh, if you want to use it for this particular project, um, also a very good choice. So um, we're gonna we're gonna do like a little uh, demonstration. Let me put the camera over here and get my keyboard back. Um, this year we'll need it later. All right. Um, cool. So um, QMK it actually comes with a little tool also called QMK, a little command line tool. Um, I have actually installed this uh, in Arch Linux. So this is actually packaged in Arch Linux. Um, I, I think it's not, no, it's not in the main repositories, but it is in the Arch user repository. Um, I think, was it? Oh yeah, it's this one here. Um, oh yeah, there's even a newer version. I should update it at some point. Um, oh, if you're using Arch, totally upvote it here, right? Um, go to Arch user repository. Uh, QMK, you'll find it here. Uh, if you don't have an if you don't have an AUR account yet, create one, um, and then vote for this package, um, so that um, the Arch developers will see that is a popular package. If you're using it, vote for it, um, and then the chances are higher that it will actually go into the main distribution, and that would be cool. Um, so anyway, um, the QMK tool it does a whole lot of things. Um, it like you can just use the QMK tool as the main front end for all of your QMK work. You can say things like, let me let me go into temp and do a quick demonstration. You can say QMK clone. Um, it will just clone the default GitHub repository, but um, I'm going to publish a couple of repositories for the individual Teensy versions um, that I'm going to support. So there will be one for the Teensy++, um, there will be one for the uh, Teensy 3.6, um, and I'm planning to upstream all of that work into QMK proper, of course, um, but it is kind of hard to make an argument uh, that they should accept your pull request for a hardware revision that doesn't yet exist. Um, so I figured I'd release it first, um, release the repositories on my own. You can very easily clone them using QMK clone, just specify uh, the, the repository URL, um, and then they're going to be upstream properly soon. Uh, so now um, QMK firmware, um, we have this uh, checkout here. Um, we can do... Um, if I do QMK, enter. Um, oh yeah, so just vote it, nice. Uh, thank you. So um, we can do QMK compile. Um, so, you know, we've just cloned it, right? So we haven't done any configuration whatsoever. If we just want a default build um, of a keyboard controller firmware that will work with um, the old board of mine, the 2013 board, um, this is how we would do it. Uh, Kinesis slash Stapleberg, we've already seen that in the configurator. You can see it compiles and then it's done, right? So now we have this hex file here. This is the firmware file that we would flash onto our Teensy. Um, we can even do this from inside of QMK. We can say QMK flash, um, just like we did to compile. Um, so if we just say flash, um, it would now say, okay, um, you know, the Teensy loader is ready. Um, press the reset button to now reprogram your firmware. Um, so this is this is all that you need to get started, right? This is literally just two commands once you have QMK installed. Very simple. If you don't want to install QMK, you can just use the web generator to get a firmware file to start out with. Um, and then, you know, there's no limits in your creativity um, and how far you want to go. But uh, I think this is a really slick and polished experience. Uh, this is definitely like, you know, 
keyboard controller firmware wise the, the best firmware or or firmware wise period the best firmware process that I've seen right um, very impressive uh, there's like list keyboards to get an impression of what keyboards are actually implemented you can see this list is really really long right like anyone who ever did any keyboard work and wanted to run QMK on it seems to have contributed this upstream and that's obviously not true so you can see how much more people have actually used QMK on their keyboards. So pretty impressive. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not, by no means an expert on QMK, right? I've just ported it to uh, a couple of targets um, and I intend to port it to all of the Teensy targets for my keyboard. Um, but from what I've seen so far is actually really well done, uh, both in terms of how it's used, uh, how it's presented, uh, how it is documented. Uh, this has a lot of promise. Uh, if you do anything in keyboard hacking, try to contribute to QMK. Um, and a lot of people will benefit from it. This is really good. All right, um, any QMK questions or any firmware questions? Uh, I mean, at this point, we could totally like, you know, dive into the C project, but that's not what I want to do today. Um, I just want to say, you know, a, a firmware exists, it works. Um, I'm going to show it later um, how this works. Um, you know, most of it you've already seen, the compilation and the flashing. Uh, the only missing bit is how it actually then shows up uh, on your computer. And, and, you know, maybe I'm going to do it on camera. Um, but the other big thing that I wanted to do is actually solder one with you all together. Um, so you can see that it's really not much work um, and you don't need any skill whatsoever. Um, if you have like, uh, yeah, just, you know, follow, follow my lead here. So uh, if you're all ready for this, uh, we're totally going to get into it. Um, there's one more thing that I want to prepare. Actually, I don't know if, I think I have linked this here. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. This is very important. Um, so this is one of my most popular tweets. Uh, you can see like, huh, not even the 10,000. I thought it crossed the 10,000 by now. You know what to do. Um, this is a, a, a reference card from Adafruit. Um, Adafruit in general, very cool shop um, based in New York. Um, they, uh, th yeah, Adafruit is like, it is a very polished shop for anything microcontroller related you want to do. If you want to just have like, you know, a tiny uh, LED strip and a fitting microcontroller, um, Adafruit has most definitely everything to get you started and everything to get you upgraded too. And a lot of instructions uh, and a lot of variety in their products and a lot of really well thought out things. Um, one other product of um, Adafruit uh, that I really like is the Circuit Playground Express. Um, this one here, product ID 3333. Um, this is a really cool little microcontroller board. Uh, you can see that it has a bunch of things already on it. Uh, it has like this very cool RGB LED ring. Uh, it has, uh, uh, you know, sensors that detect which way you orient it in the room. Uh, you can see it has sound input, audio output. Uh, it, you can connect a battery to it. You can even charge a battery from it, I think. It has USB on the other end. You can run micro Python on it. You can also run tiny Go on it. Um, so this is really cool. It only costs a couple bucks, $25. Um, if you want like an, an all-in-one introduction into like a wide variety of microcontroller things, and you just want to play around with a, a, a product that is already a very good starting point for really many things, uh, this is what I would recommend. Um, and yeah, it's it's an Adafruit thing, and these are generally great. Um, so yeah, strongly recommend Adafruit, great thing. Um, also, this particular reference card that they have here, um, it really explains everything that you need to know about soldering um, for this particular project very concisely. So let's go through it. Um, <laughs> you should use a soldering iron. Huh. Um, yeah, I, I, I figured most of us would have figured this out. Um, good to say, though. <laughs> um, secondly, um, you know, use a proper soldering station. I'm going to violate this rule today for a reason I'm going to tell you. Um, use a chisel tip instead of a pointed tip. Okay, if you have the selection, sure. Um, for our purposes, any tip will work. No worries. And then the, the main soldering itself, um, this, is, this is really good. Um, heat the part and the pad, this is important, for two to three seconds, right? So you want to go at it with an angle here. Um, heat both the, the pin in this pad, in this in this uh, case um, and the pad, uh, and then once they're heated up, you can just count to three if you want. If you don't have like a good feel for it, or if, if you know if if you want a easy to reproduce instruction, you add the solder. You can see you add the solder ideally from the other side. So 
uh, the pin should be hot at this point, so the solder will just melt and then uh, distribute. Um, you know, sometimes this works well. Um, I'm going to show you a little trick later um, to make this work a little bit better. Then continue heating for one to two seconds and let it cool. Um, don't blow. Um, you can see the result here. If it looks like this, if it, if it has this sort of shape here, this sort of round shape at the edges, and it kind of like flows towards the top, this is perfect. This is what you want your soldering joints to look like. If you have the blob, you have too much solder. If you have not enough solder, you will see it because the pad will show through. If you have a cold joint, you will see that you have the blob here um, and the pad shows, so it's not making contact. You just have a blob of solder on the pin and maybe it's making contact sometimes, but it's definitely not a good solder joint. Um, if you have too much heat, you're gonna damage, um, I suppose this is actually the, the stop solder mask. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't managed to do this. Um, and if you have a short, that just means that two of them are connected. So now you're soldering experts as far as this particular project is concerned. Um, there's a couple of things that I need to set up, but I figured I'd also show you how I set my things up um, so that, you know, it's, it's the real deal. You're gonna see the whole thing. Um, so, let me see. Let me actually uh, prepare my camera here. Um, how are we gonna do this? Yeah, I think, I think this is what we're gonna do for starters. Cool. Um, so this is part of my desk. Um, you can see we have the old keyboard controller that actually goes off into the project box. Um, I like using IKEA boxes for individual projects because then I can uh, very easily uh, move them around and move everything that is part of the project. Um, and it's very easy to you know, find and search through, search for stuff, etc. Um, so what we have here is just, um, you know, uh, actual solder, right? Um, you can get this at any electronic store. Um, there are differences in solder, but they don't really matter. Just, you know, choose the most popular solder. Uh, if you're a beginner, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Um, there's leaded and lead-free solder. Um, these days you will get lead-free. Um, it's okay. Um, don't worry about it. Then, um, aside from the solder, we're actually also going to use a soldering iron. Um, I have this particular one here, um, which you might recognize as, let me get the box. Oh, okay, sorry, I need to actually move, not just stretch. Oh, so this is the TS100 soldering iron. Um, this is a pretty popular soldering iron in the low cost segment. Uh, so if you don't have any soldering equipment at home, and you don't have any access to any lab or any makerspace, hackerspace, uh, you know, workspace, a hobby room, community share, whatever place where you could get some tools. Um, this might be a good introduction into soldering for you. Um, oh, actually, is this stream still working? Wait, let me go back here. Yeah, my phone is complaining that its battery is soon gonna run out. So I'm gonna uh, connect it up to its charger. And then I'm gonna restart. Uh, okay, I'm gonna try and restart this here. Oh, there we go. All right, um, so this is apparently what happens when the iPhone interrupts the camera application. Um, okay, so the TS100 is a good intro soldering iron because um, the quality is actually pretty good. Um, this actually can run open source firmware on it. I'm gonna show you in a sec. Um, not that that would be a huge consideration, but it is also cheap um, and it is widely available. Um, you can get it, I think, on AliExpress for very cheap if you're willing to wait a little while. I got this one from a local um, hobby electronics store because I didn't want to wait. Um, but yeah, so uh, I don't know, what is the current price for it? Um, maybe people can post a link in the chat unless that will get them flagged as spammers. Um, I hope I have actually removed um, all of these triggers from the, the Twitch bot. Um, but you know, if you just Google for the TS100 soldering iron, I think you'll find it at like 50-ish bucks or so. Um, maybe a little cheaper, maybe a little more expensive, depending on where you are. Um, in combination, uh, or in addition to the soldering iron itself, you're gonna need a power supply for it. Um, I'm gonna use this uh, universal power supply that I bought. It is super bulky. Um, but it was the only one that was available in stock at my local electronics store. Um, and, 
you know, during the uh, Corona time, um, I just take what I can get. And I figured this would be a good test as well for uh, the keyboard controller project, because if you can actually get all of the equipment and all of the parts that you need to make during a global pandemic, um, you know, you should be set always, right? Like if it works now, it will work all the time. Um, cool, so I plugged in the power supply. I turned on the soldering iron. Uh, you can see on the uh, LCD here, it has like these two little icons. Uh, the bottom one is settings and the top one is soldering iron. Um, it has two physical buttons on here, the B button and the A button. Uh, B corresponds to the bottom function, A to the top function. So if I press A, it will turn on the soldering iron. If I press B, I can go through the settings menu. All right, um, so I'm just gonna rest this on my desk here. And this is the rule that I'm gonna violate, uh, the Adafruit rule about um, a proper station. Oh, maybe also mention the TS80 due to its USB-C connector. Yeah, uh, sorry, if you're in the market for like a soldering iron, there's not only the TS100, but also the successor TS80. It's kind of weird that they named the successor 80 uh, if the original one was 100. Like, you know, what sort of marketing department thought that was a good idea? Um, anyway, um, that, you know, uh, as Mike said, it has a USB-C connector. Um, it, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if like, I, you know, I've seen YouTube videos that suggested to me that there is no, uh, no incentive to upgrade sort of from a TS100 to a TS80. So the difference isn't huge. Um, if you want to go with the latest and greatest, check out the reviews and see if you want the 80 for yourself. Um, if maybe only the TS100 is available readily, don't worry about it, I would say. Um, but for sure, the, you know, the USB-C connector is handy if you use this the way it's meant to be used, which is as a portable soldering iron, right? That you can just take out and about uh, maybe to your local hackerspace or something. Um, though it would be weird if they didn't have a soldering iron. So I, I don't know, maybe if you want to fix something in the field, uh, you could just you know, use it from your battery pack or something. Uh, you don't need this uh, power supply here. So better for that use case, doesn't matter for our particular use case. Uh, one thing that I'm gonna do though, um, is um, I'm gonna get a, a sponge. Um, and you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what you would do, uh, you know, if, if you don't have one of these, they come with the soldering station. Uh, maybe there's a good substitute for it. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to show you why in just a sec. Um, but for now, uh, let me just uh, quickly mute here and I'll be right back. All right, um, I am back. A wet paper towel, yeah. Um, I think that would be that be a good substitute. Um, I'm always a bit hesitant with regards to paper towels um, when it comes to uh, you know very hot stuff landing on them. Uh, you know you don't want your hot solder to kind of burn through it. But depending on how you use the sponge, it should be fine. You just need to be a little bit careful. Um, anyway, I'm going to show you how to use it. Um, but uh, this is uh, this is the sponge that I mean. Um, I just soaked it uh, with water thoroughly and then uh, wringed it out a little bit. Um, so at this point, it is still a little bit wet. It is wet enough um, to um, you know, be able to, to take the solder. Um, but yeah, uh, TS80 looks pretty interesting, a bit more expensive, but USB-C is attractive. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for mentioning it. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, this is the PCB that we're gonna solder. Um, one step that I have already done um, is that um, this should be it. Yeah. So when you get it from the fab, you can see that um, here, sorry, here on the outside of the PCB, there are these little noses here. And this is a, a result a leftover from the panelization. Um, so you'll need to kind of like get these off somehow. Um, the way I do it is I just use a file. Um, 
let me show you. Just have like a you know regular file like this, and then you just you know file it off. Um, so I did that as uh, sort of the only preparation step um, because I wanted to do it outside, um, you know, where the uh, where the dust is not a uh, concern to anyone. Um, so that's the only thing I've done, and all of the rest uh, you're gonna see live here right now. Um, actually, using brass wool, don't know the actual name. Uh, would be better as wet sponge will change temperature of the tip instantly. You are correct. Um, yeah, the the steel wool is better. Um, I don't have any though. <laughs> uh, I have some uh, like at my uh, preferred workspace, but I can't access it right now due to Corona. Um, so yeah, maybe I should order some at some point. Uh, sea fold paper with water around on a metal box is what I was thinking, not tissue paper. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. Cool, um, yeah, brass wool recommended. All right, cool. So um, let's get all of the parts that we need. Um, I have already shown you the um, Diggy Key Molex connectors. So um, we're gonna get six Molex connectors. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then, um, oh, right. uh, let me see, okay, so the blue LEDs, um, they come in sort of a different packaging here um, because they're sensitive to, I don't know, static or something. Um, then, uh, the resistors come in yet another packaging, because uh, why not? Um, these are sort of the pre-packed packaging that uh, DiggyKey uses. Um, I think I also have another already open resistor baggie somewhere. Um, oh yeah, and then we have pin headers um, here. Lots of pin headers. Um, yeah. That is, I think that is all we need. And there it is, yeah. Um, and then obviously, so the one thing that you might be, uh, that you might be missing is a Teensy microcontroller. And it turns out that um, <laughs> I sort of made a mistake here in that I didn't actually order a Teensy microcontroller uh, for this particular build because I only had, like I ordered enough microcontrollers for doing sort of uh, development on all of the platforms. So I have, uh, let me see, it should be, it should be here somewhere. Uh, is it? Maybe. Let me see. Oh, I must have it actually in the in the keyboard. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have I have one of them like this. Uh, this is like a Teensy plus plus microcontroller that is um, using pin headers, and it goes into the socket that you can see on my development board. Um, so in here, you can see that I have these sockets and I can just uh, place the controller um, on top here and just plug it in like so. Um, this is a very good mechanism for development, but um, we can't actually close the keyboard like this because it's too high. Um, so we need to actually solder in the Teensy microcontroller and I can demonstrate to you the mechanical properties uh, in just a sec once we've done this and once we actually insert it into the keyboard. Um, but the yeah, so the, the problem is that I don't have a spare Teensy 3.6 or a spare Teensy++. Um, I do have a whole bunch of different spare Teensies. Uh, let me show you. I have, let me move this around here, here, here. Um, I have a Teensy 4.1. Um, that I already added headers to. I have uh, Teensy 4.1 without headers. Um, I thought, yeah, I have another one that I already opened up on stream earlier. I have a Teensy 4.0 with headers and two more Teensy 4.0 without headers. Um, and then <laughs> I have the Teensy LC, Teensy 3.2 and Teensy 3.5 but these are all for development only. Uh, so the, 
The question now is, well, which one are we going to solder into this particular controller? Uh, the unfortunate consequence of this confusion is that uh, we will not be able to solder this together and then actually verify that this particular keyboard controller works because I don't have software ready for the 4.1 yet. Um, what we will do instead is we're going to solder it together so that you can see how it works. And then I'm going to show you how I would verify, for example, my development board. Um, and that way you can kind of see um, how the process works, even though it's not precisely the same board. So I'm sorry about that uh, confusion or, uh, you know, not being prepared well enough here. But um, I think you'll get the gist, and it doesn't really matter which teams you solder in. Um, so for your own reproducibility, this does not harm it in any way. Um, so no worries. Cool. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, TNZ 4.1 here because it has all of the GPIO pins that we need for all of the LEDs and it is the fastest TNZ after all. Um, so I think myself, I would probably use this one. Um, so I'm just going to solder this in um, and then I have a good motivation to also do some more work on the software because um, that way I could actually then use the board and that would be kind of cool. All right. Um, so these are the parts, and then um, we have the, the pins here, the pins, pin headers we need. The LEDs we're gonna do later, um, also because they require a little bit of different soldering technique, and then the spare teens I'm gonna put in the corner. All right. Um, so there are different ways that we can start. Um, we could just solder this teensy on top of here, like so, uh, with the pin headers and then afterwards do the connectors. But I think I'm gonna go with the connectors first uh, for the simple reason that if I add the pin headers now here, I will no longer be able to um, do a little trick to get the, uh, to make it a little bit easier to solder the, uh, the connectors, which is that I'm gonna put these connectors in and then I'm gonna turn the board around and sort of lay it on its connectors um, and I can no longer do that because the connectors are not as high as the pin headers are. Um, so it kind of matters in which order you do the build, but only if you want the build to go as smoothly as possible. You will always be able to kind of make it work, um, but if you want to make it as simple and as little effort for you as possible and as high a chance that it will work as possible, I would recommend you do it like the way I'm going to show you how to do it. All right, so step one is uh, we're going to plug these in. Um, let me see. They can only go in in the correct direction. So there is, you can see that it has 13 pins, but there's more pins at the top layer than at the bottom layer. So um, you can see this here as well. There's no way you can get these in wrong. Um, so just plug them in um, like so and like so. And we're going to do a KB600 build. Um, but probably also populate the pin header so that we could put it into KB500 as well if we really needed to, because I kind of like the flexibility here. Um, and it's easy to do, so why not? All right, so then now that they're all uh, put in, we're gonna push them all down so that they're like locked in and turn this around, right? And then just press down a little bit just to make sure that it's really like on the table surface, and it is. Um, we're going to use like the, the little Teensy card here. It is a multifunctional card. It not only shows you the pinout, it is also a great soldering base. Um, so, <laughs> well, I mean, it's not that great. There's going to be a lot of solder on my desk, but eh, that's how it is. Uh, the desk is used to it. Um, a lot of like, not solder per se, but like the little droplets, of flux, etc. You know what I mean. I would recommend you do a solder on like a separate work surface, but hey, we're, we're all gonna make do with what we have here. Um, so I figured I'd do it like, you know, with as little uh, requirements as possible. So um, soldering iron, gonna turn it on here. You can see that it now shows the temperature. It heats up rather quickly. Um, I'm just gonna like lay it down here for a sec. Uh, you see that the choice of connector here, like the, the power supply that you have makes a difference in how well you can use the soldering iron. Um, I wish there was a good station for it. I haven't found a good station. If you know of a good station, let me know because it would be a good addition. Um, like a station is something where you can kind of just like rest the soldering iron in. Um, most soldering uh, irons actually come with a station, but you know, this one is a portable one. Let me catch up with the chat real quick. Um, so the barrel connector is a bit loose. Sometimes power gets disconnected. Hope that's not a problem with the TS80. Heat resistant USB-C cables might be hard to come by though. Yeah. 
Uh, is heat resistant really needed though? Um, if it's getting hot there, sounds like a bigger issue. Mm, yeah, see, the problem is if you do kind of like this, right? And then you kind of like do this, like if you're not careful, um, it is simple to to like, or you know, more, more commonly, if I laid this soldering iron down like this, um, you can, you can see this, right? Like it gravitates to the cable, right? So you really need to be careful how you place it, not too close to anything else. Um, and it's very easy to like make a mistake here. Um, and also keep in mind, this tip is now 320 degrees Celsius. So really don't touch it and really don't touch anything else with it. Super hot. Um, I have seen burn marks on older stations at the local hackers, but ooh, yes, yes. Okay, um, so let's actually get started. Let's do some soldering. So I have the uh, the actual solder here um, on my left, like behind the camera. Um, the way I'm gonna go through these is, um, I'm gonna make it so that I can reach these the easiest, right? So I'm gonna start by soldering the outer pins here, and then here, and then I'm gonna turn the board, solder the outer pins here, solder the inner pins here, turn it again, um, solder the inner pins there, and then I have all of the pins soldered. Right. Um, plus, of course, the, the bottom connectors as well. Um, but the idea is to really make sure that um, everything should be easily reachable, right? Because if you need to like make strange moves while soldering, it usually doesn't end well. Um, you will make it easier for yourself if you just pay attention to like a little bit of alignment and move your board around and maybe find some tools um, to kind of like, you know, um, put it in, fix it in somewhere. Um, so let me see, the, the camera quality, I'm not sure if we can do much about it, um, but what we can totally do, if we can get this camera a little bit closer. Hope this is not too jarring. All right, uh, and let's see, that makes it worse. Maybe like so. I don't know. All right. Um, I, I hope you'll be able to see something at all. Um, anyway, so here it goes. So I'm not gonna like heat up the pad from the right side, right? Um, you can count to three in order to, to wait for the pad to be warm. And then I'm gonna come with the solder from the other side. You can see that this doesn't really work yet because it's not hot enough yet. But if I come from the top side and kind of push it into the tip, then I can actually come from the other side and it is hot now. I'm gonna rest here for another two seconds and then just remove the tip, All right? So now the, the sponge comes into play. Um, so, yeah, okay, so on the tip here, let me see if you can see this. Um, it is hard to see on camera, but there is a little bit of solder residue, um, maybe, maybe like so. Yeah, now you can see it hanging off of the tip. Um, and we're just going to swipe that off, off of this sponge. Um, now, of course, this changes the temperature, as people observed earlier. Um, but we're just going to give it a couple seconds to come back to temperature. Typically, I use the um, hand is not that transparent. Oh, is my hand transparent? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Um, uh, we're, we're just going to, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use the sponge like in between maybe every connector, not after every uh, soldering point. There's no harm in having a little bit of old solder on your soldering iron tip, but um, the I, I've been given to understand that the flux in the solder uh, actually evaporates very quickly. So um, in order for the solder to flow ideally, you would want a fresh uh, infusion of flux, so to say. So if you have old solder, add some new solder, and that way it should work better. Um, so you're gonna see me do this a couple of times, but let's actually uh, inspect the soldering point that I made here. Um, you can sort of do this in the light. Um, I apologize that this is not not very easy to see on camera, probably. Um, not at all, actually, in the position that I was in. But let's see if I'm going to... Yeah. Eh. Kind of like this, maybe? Very hard to see. Sorry about that. But it kind of looks like the good soldering joint <laughs> from the reference. Um, so trust me on this for now. I'm going to solder a couple more and then I'm going to try and show you again. Uh, I suppose that as soon as more soldering points are visible, the chances are higher that the camera can capture any of them. 
Um, and at this point, uh, so, you know, the soldering a hundred or so connections or however many this is, will take a little bit of time. So, you know, if, if you have like a good record to listen to, now would be the time to put on some music um, or fetch a beverage of your choice or ask a question on chat. Um, you will need to feed quite a bit of solder into these. Uh, you can kind of see that I'm feeding like, I don't know, three centimeters or so, but this is a very thin uh, roll of solder. Oh, you probably can't see that because of my hand. Yeah, sorry about that. Let me actually try and see if I can do this here. Um, yeah, I probably, you know what I would, what I should probably do? I should probably rearrange this just a little bit. Rearrange this, so. Let's see if this is gonna work. Oh, actually. Let me use the, the fancy uh, camera mount features here and try to do it. Try to do it like so. Maybe actually fix that camera. Ooh. You can see I'm a pro at this. Um, oh, but if I did this and then that, maybe. Yeah, hey, this looks kind of good. Um, cool. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's give this another shot. Uh, sorry, this is my first time soldering on camera. So uh, bear with me. All right. Um, so let me feed like let's see. There we go. Oh, that was not good. We're probably gonna fix this with uh, when we actually cover that soldering point. I got like a little bit of solder on the other joint here. That's cool. So we're just gonna move on here. Um, now you can see, can you see this? Uh, there we go. Yeah, I, I again have some residue on my soldering iron here, so I'm just gonna swipe this off real quick. All right. Um, all right, um, yeah, it's, it's not, super visible so I'll definitely need to like work on a proper camera setup um, if I want to like actually capture the soldering process I think I was hoping that maybe I could like reuse the stream footage to just show people how this works I think I can like show people the general concept um, but maybe the soldering I need like special footage for All right, almost done with this connector. The solder is a bit stubborn, but I'm also holding it at a very unnatural angle because of the camera. All right, let's see. Um, we now need to turn the board, and this is also a good chance to kind of like introspect where we stand. Uh, let's see if we can do this on camera. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. Kinda? It's, it's not super in focus. I don't know how to make it focus. But yeah. Um, in before you spent dollars on a pro camera capture card, etc., etc. <laughs> I can relate, yeah. I actually have a GoPro here now, very recently, um, but you cannot use a GoPro as a uh, actual like live camera, which is sort of disappointing, unless you buy the media mod, which just gives you an HDMI output, and then you can use it plus a capture card to get like good quality live video input. Um, but I didn't buy the media mod because honestly, like the GoPro is already expensive and the media mod just for an HDMI port, 
I don't know, man. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe I should. Maybe that is the easiest upgrade to actually get the footage for the soldering here. Um, you know, or actually, you know, for, for recorded footage, I could, of course, also just record using the GoPro. And then, you yeah, know, that should be fine. So a couple of things that beginners like to do wrong here is they don't heat up the pin enough before they try to solder. And especially, they don't leave the solder enough time to actually flow um, after they add the solder. So they skip the last like two second period where you just keep heating the element. Um, and that is actually a crucial period. I mean, all of the steps are kind of crucial, <laughs> but this is a, a common mistake that beginners make, me included. So yeah, just wait a little bit longer and then just move your tip off. Um, if you're like close or if you have like a magnifying glass or something, um, you can actually also kind of see this happen, um, which is kind of cool to see. So I would encourage you to just look at how the solder behaves and how it flows. Um, and that way you'll quickly learn. Thus far, I have taught a couple of people soldering, um, largely using either, uh, you know, the, um, using the Adafruit reference card that I showed you earlier, or just essentially telling people what's in there. Uh, and every single one of the people that I've taught soldering has picked it up within a couple of minutes, um, at most an hour or so. And everybody was able to successfully solder their own kit, um, like a you know, little beginner's electronics kit. Um, so I am very convinced that this particular project is solderable by anybody um, who is able to do soldering. Uh, or you know, who is able to learn soldering, and you should be able to learn very easily, typically. Um, before you go down that route, lighting is probably way more important. Yeah, the lighting in this room is terrible right now. DSLR and still photos might be enough for a soldering tutorial for sure, but I thought it would be kind of cool to do like a full video tutorial on this, um, just because I want to make it very, very approachable for beginners, um, because this is really a cool project to like get started in this world. And it would be a shame if people thought they couldn't do it just because there wasn't a video online of how to do it. Um, but yeah, some people obviously prefer text and images. Um, and you know, in the GitHub repository, there's already a textual soldering instruction. Um, and it would be cool if I just add a couple images to that um, as, a, as a good first improvement, um, or you know, as an improvement, regardless of whether I did a video or how I did a video. But yeah, more documentation for the soldering, definitely a good idea. But it's also very simple. Uh, the, the idea of this board is also that even if you don't read any of the documentation, like if you just ordered the board off of Oshpark, uh, you should be able to make it work because the silk screen is so clear. And if you have the correct parts, um, it's very obvious how they all like go in here, right? Um, so yeah, all right, cool. So this is the outer row of all of the four connectors, two more outer rows because we're doing the KB600 build where we have the thumb pads on FPC connectors as well. So now we're gonna solder these. Come on. Feeding solder properly is like an art in its own, um, in the sense that, you know, if, you, if you're working alone, and sometimes you really shouldn't, sometimes you need another person to hold things for you. But if you're working alone and you don't have like good tools to place your boards, um, maybe you need to hold them at a weird angle or you need to fix them with one hand or something. And then you kind of make these weird maneuvers to feed the solder into it. Um, or put some solder onto the tip and then that way make a soldering joint um, and then later fix it up. Um, but, you know, just using one hand, like what I sometimes like to do is just like, and you're going to see me do this later, actually, just like leave the solder um, dangling in the air like this, right? 
Um, and then, you know, if, if, I, if I needed to use my hand like this to hold the board in place, um, I could just uh, use my tip here, uh, take a little bit of solder, do a soldering joint, um, and that way do it one-handed, right? Um, but yeah, this requires a little bit of practice. But yeah, um, this is going to be very similar to the technique we're going to use for the LEDs later on in just a little bit. So, um, second connector, outer row. Soldering is very meditative. And depending on the project, you can do a lot of it. <laughs> uh, in this project, it's all very simple soldering. In other projects, it's much more elaborate. Um, <laughs> use proper ventilation when soldering. You're correct. I just don't have proper ventilation in here. Um, again, if you can do it in the lab, totally do it in the lab. Um, Use the correct security precautions, safety precautions, I mean. Um, in here, I'm trying to not breathe in too much of the fumes. Um, you know, it's not lead solder, so it won't outright poison me. It will just poison me a little bit. Um, not using a stand to hold your PCB? No, not right now. Um, this one actually, like, you know, because of the connectors that we put in, like so, um, this one stands on the connectors. Um, and that way, you know, it's, it's perfect. It's a perfect stand. It is perfectly balanced, like it's rock solid on here. Um, you can't make it any better. There's no need to use any sort of uh, stand for this particular bit of soldering. Um, in general though, totally um, totally use a stand. Open up a window at least. Ah, no time for this. Um, we're gonna do it the dirty way. All right, so uh, inside rows now. Also, how do you know my window is not open? Uh, Oops, sorry. Don't want to move the camera while I solder. Come on. I'm gonna like visually inspect all of these uh, in proper light myself off camera uh, in a little bit and see if we need to redo any of them, but I don't think we'll need to. This is really so straightforward. Yeah, um, I was mentioning that it can be very meditative for some projects, like for the terminal server I've built, I've spent literally days soldering and, and really doing nothing but soldering. Uh, and yeah, it is, it is interesting. It's kind of like um, a counterpart to, um, a counterpart to uh, you know doing all the software engineering work where you have to think and make decisions. And in soldering, you you don't really need to think a lot. You sometimes need to like problem solve and use your intuition and uh, you know do things like that. But in general, it is uh, very repetitive, which can be relaxing sometimes. Um, keyboard hacking, like what's the purpose? Um, I think you joined later maybe. Um, I did explain a couple of use cases why people would want their own keyboard controller in a keyboard. Um, originally, I got into this whole thing because I was fixing a bug that the manufacturer didn't fix or at least not in time or it would be too complicated to fix. Um, but I also figured out the input latency of my uh, keyboard controller, which was a very nice uh, sort of research thing that I could only do because I built all of this myself and it's all open and accessible. Um, uh, some people like to add, you know, fancy modifications to their keyboards. Some people like to um, add LEDs actually, uh, you know, configure different layers in software, et cetera. For some things you just need free firmware. Um, there's also like more advanced integrations that you can think of like, um, you know, security keys, uh, like, uh, you know, FIDO or U2F security keys built into your keyboard. I don't know if it's a great idea, but it's definitely an idea that you could do. Um, or you could add some USB storage, some virtual maybe, um, for, I don't know, credentials or, you know, encrypted key files or something. Um, 
there's like lots of possibilities here really like it's it's a computer um you know a keyboard is just a computer very tiny computer just a microcontroller um, but that view actually really changes really quickly as you move up uh, through the different teensies right the teensy plus plus just um started out as like this atmel controller 16 megahertz and then you go to the teensy 3 suddenly you have an arm controller 48 megahertz um, and then you know, you go to the Teensy 4.1, you have 600 megahertz. That's like a phone. Uh, that's like that's like faster than the first PC that I had in your keyboard, you know, just for seeing if buttons were pushed. Um, really, there's a lot you could do here with all of that compute power. Um, you know, in terms of additional feature integration, the yeah, your, your fantasy is the limit. Um, you know, maybe this is not for you and that's fine too. Uh, some people just like to tinker and Keyboards uh, is a very individual thing. Uh, you would be surprised if you're not familiar with how uh, how varied the, the keyboard hacking scene is. Like there is a proper keyboard for every person on this planet, it seems, um, and you know, proper set of keycaps. And why would you only have one keyboard? Surely you must have multiple for different occasions and reasons and moods and styles, you know? This, it's, like, it's like a proper hobby. You could do it just because or you could do it not at all. Or because you really need to fix that keyboard in front of you. You're not using any flux. I'm not using any flux aside from the flux that is already in my solder, of course, right? Um, I don't need any explicit flux uh, in addition here. Um, I would add flux uh, for SMD soldering. Um, for the little bit of SMD soldering we're gonna do on this particular board, I'm not even gonna add any explicit flux. Uh, the one in my solder is gonna be enough. Um, you're gonna see that in action later. All right, two more rows on the inside for the KB600 connectors. And then we're gonna turn this around and continue with the next step. Sorry, moving the camera again. Uh, still waiting for that Bitcoin miner on the, uh, on the keyboard. Yeah, have fun. Um, I guess the obvious question is, um, how much will your input latency be affected by all the Bitcoin calculation? Um, and will it be sufficient to use a real-time operating system to balance these two tasks in such a way that one doesn't influence the other? Um, I would guess it would even be possible, but at the same time, you know, why would you mind Bitcoin? Both in general and on your keyboard. All right. Cool. Um, had to step away for a bit. Have you looked at getting an Elgato key light yet? It's really nice. And I even built a Prometheus Explorer recamera and lighting. Yeah, I have to say it is, uh, it is definitely moving up the list. Um, I actually got this, uh, fancy mounted green screen, uh, behind me because it was, it was, uh, it was getting annoying to like stand up the green screen all the time. Like every time I wanted to stream. Um, so now it's ceiling mounted, which is really cool. Um, that takes a lot of the setup out. Um, pretty happy with the setup, but obviously the, you know, having a ceiling mounted green screen in the middle of the room kind of changes the light in your room. Uh, so now lighting is actually a subject. Yeah. Um, I, uh, if you have like any good articles or any good like YouTube videos about what sort of considerations go into proper lighting. Uh, I would be very interested to see that. Um, and yeah, I mean, probably I should get a light of some sort at some point. The question is just which one and when and how do I install it and where do I point it and how many do I need and why is this going to be so expensive? And it's going to be your fault. But it's cool. You know, I, I send you to my hobbies, uh, you send me to yours. Um, this is for the Kinesis Advantage, right? Does it use flex cables like the IBM Model M? Um, I mean, it does use flex cables. I'm gonna show you in just a little bit. Um, stay stay in stream and you'll see. A Prometheus exporter for the light, <laughs> what data does it actually produce? Well, if it's turned on, I suppose, or not. Don't have much info since I just did random Googling. Some people say you need two, but to be honest, it's I seem to be getting by just fine with one just off the side on the back of my desk. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, see, yeah. I, I probably should just uh, should just get one and then see how it behaves. Um, ideally, I would also want to use this not only for when I'm on stream, but also for when I need to use good light for you know working on a project like this actually. Um, 
or just in general, like um, having a, a change in the in the light setup here. Oh come on, um, in this room would be good. Um, there might be some improvements that are you know entirely unrelated to streaming. So maybe it's a larger project, or maybe I'm just making it too complicated. Um, on off brightness percent, color temperature in Kelvin, Ooh, and a bit of metadata like serial and firmware version. You'd love it then. It goes crazy bright. 40% for streaming, and that's already really, really bright. Yeah, see, I don't, um, I, I think, I, I totally believe you, right? Um, but having a light that is bright is only part of the consideration. I also wonder about how direct it should be, because I, in general, like indirect light a lot more than direct light. But if I had direct light just for my work surface, um, without having to look into it, like if it was below eye level or behind some sort of enclosure or something, that would be cool. Um, I was thinking maybe for my desk, I should just get like a light on an arm so that I could just um, have it folded away and then just pull it out like this. Uh, maybe that's something to tackle at some point. But there are also more and other projects that I also want to do. Um, so we'll see uh, how this how this ranks. Captain Disillusion on YouTube has a nice video related to how you should set up lighting for green screens. Poke me later and try to find it. Cool, I will. How easy is it to temporarily use a quartz QWERTY slash quartz keyboard layout again, once one is really used to the Neo layout. Um, very easy for me. So for me, learning the Neo layout was a separate thing. So I never unlearned QWERTY, but I also consciously used different keyboards. So I only learned Neo on the Kinesis first, and I was used to QWERTS from everywhere else. So in my mind, I can kind of like just switch between the muscle memory for QWERTY and the muscle memory for Neo. And I can also switch between the layouts now. So I can type Neo on a traditionally QWERTY layout now. Um, it's no big deal. So I find that is actually possible. No, no uh, impediment there. Um, also just got an Elgato Stream Desk as an early birthday present and have already integrated with my key light next up OBS and other stuff. Yeah, I am curious to see how this all plays out. So uh, yeah, please keep us or me in the loop. Um, in particular, the Elgato Stream Deck, I don't have a good uh, understanding of what one can do with it. Like I looked at the product page, but like it, it didn't entirely click. So maybe I just need to see it in action and somebody needs to tell me like, you know, how this would work. All right, uh, lots of talking, not a lot of soldering, but I think we actually have made all of the connections. Let me actually uh, look at this in the light over here real quick. Okay. They're not all perfectly pretty, but they're all definitely going to work. And there's no, uh, there's no shorts. There's no, uh, there's no blobs or anything, no cold solder joints. There is a little bit of excess solder um, on the PCB. Um, over here, uh, can you see this? Kind of. I'm just going to go there with the soldering iron tip, just like move around a little bit. And it picked it up. And then I'm just going to scrape it off on the sponge. Um, super easy to fix. I find that many soldering mistakes you can fix by just trying to solder again. Just uh, put the hot soldering tip on the thing again, heat it up a little bit, maybe add a little bit new solder for an additional flux, no problem. Um, and if no, there are a couple of tools and techniques that you can use to like fix any mistake. Uh, I use the program key to switch between Dvorak and QWERTY. First revision of Michael's setup though, yeah. Um, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so switching between layouts, uh, yeah, is, is totally a QMK thing. Yeah, uh, you should. You should uh, do this in QMK at some point. It should be simple. Like the, the QMK uh, key configuration is very mighty. Uh, you can do almost anything. Uh, switching between Dvorak and QWERTY should be so simple. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So now what we did is we have all of these connectors fixed in place, right? Um, let me actually... Uh, wait, how do I do this? How about this? Yeah, cool. Um, so these are all fixed now. So I can actually pull them up and push them down, right? Uh, let me let me show you. Pull up, push down, right? I can do this uh, for all of these, uh, all of this, this, and this. Uh, cool. All right, all push down again so that we can uh, use this for soldering again. Where did you get those? Um, let me fill you in on this. 
Oopsie. So let me see. This is where's my cursor here. Um, so this is the uh, repository for the keyboard controller that I am about to publish um, later today. So you're going to see a tweet about this. Um, and the connectors that I'm using are the Molex 3953-2135. Um, these are available on DigiKey, Farnell, RS Components, Mauser, and probably a bunch of other electronic stores as well. But you can see that they are well in stock at all of the big names. Um, so yeah, uh, Molex in general, very well distributed. Um, and this particular one is entirely compatible with the Kinesis ones. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. Um, let's switch back to the cam here. All right, so we have now done all of the connectors. So we can interface with the um, with the keyboard. So next up is the Teensy. And uh, you can see that on the silk screen, it actually shows you the direction in which it goes in, right? So uh, the micro USB port you can see here goes here, like as indicated by the silk screen. Um, and then you can like double, triple check that everything is correct by looking at the pin numbers, which are on the microcontroller um, and on the board and they line up. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what we want to do. Now, how do we solder this on? And the answer to this is a pin header. So um, we have a bunch of pin headers here. Let me actually just pour out all of them and then I'm gonna add back the ones that we didn't use. Um, and the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna add these pin headers in here uh, like so, come on. And like so, um, you can see that this is too long. We need to cut it off. I can show you how to do this in just a sec. Um, but then the keyboard controller kind of goes onto this like this. Um, and like the pins show up here on the top, but it is no big deal. You have enough space for this, but not really a lot more, uh, but this is okay. Um, alternatively, I think you could also do it the other way around. Like you could make it so that uh, the pin goes in this way and the microcontroller goes in this way. And then you have the rest of the pin coming up at the bottom of the board, like so. I don't think it's a problem space-wise. Um, I think I've, I, I held it into the keyboard and it should work, but I haven't actually tried it fully. So if you want to be like on the safe side, do it facing up. All right, um, so we'll need to uh, cut this one pin header um, for which I'm gonna use like this old, uh, this old cutter here. Um, you can see if you look closely and if the camera is willing to show this, um, yeah, can't quite see it, but it is pretty worn down. Like the, it is not sharp anymore. Um, you can see that it has like a couple of dents in, in the, 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 the blade. I don't know. Is it, is it called a blade? Um, the, the cutting part. Um, so this is like, you know, a bad tool, but it's still going to be fine. So it's going to be fine for uh, rough cuts like this one. Um, so let's have a look here. Um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm like in the light. Let's see if this makes it any better. Um, Kind of. Okay, so let's see how much we need to cut this. Um, this is where we want to go. And then we can just come in here with the with the tool like this. Uh, just grab it like this, right? Um, just grab it in here where we want to cut it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold both parts of it. So I'm going to hold it with my three fingers like this. Um, and then just press down. That's it. Um, pin header cut to proper length. Uh, let's repeat this for the second one as well. But yeah, super straightforward. Um, oh, for the second one, um, because we already have the connector in here, it's harder to place it and measure it. So I'm just gonna use the top one for the bottom half as well, and then repeat the entire process for the top one. Cool, done. All right. Um, so this is all of the pins that we need for the Teensy. Um, there are a couple more pins uh, in the middle here, right? Uh, so we also need to add them. Uh, these are notably for the power for the LEDs. So without the middle pins, uh, LEDs will not light up. Now, 
Um, I have cut off four pins both times. Unfortunately, this is five. The top one is not connected, I think. Um, we could have a look at this uh, in KiCad if we really wanted to know, but you know, let's do it cleanly. Let's just count one, two, three, four, five pins, uh, cut it to length, and then just add like, you know, the, the, the proper pin header in the proper place. Um, you'll need to pay attention like which one of these you use, right? Because it's easy to get confused and put it in the wrong one, but it's easy to verify this. Um, and this is also what I would recommend for soldering. But just placing your TNZ on top and you know seeing if it actually slides in right let me see this needs like uh, this needs like a little bit of care a little bit of wiggling around there we go cool so press down on it right so this is this is what it would look like um, you can see that uh, it slides down fully right uh, sorry, here, here we go. Uh, it slides down fully. Um, now, all that's left is actually soldering the pin headers in place and then soldering the pin headers onto the TNZ. Um, I like to solder both in the same go because then it cannot happen that uh, your pin header kind of moves to the wrong place and doesn't have contact. So, um, you know, if, if you know, the, the thing that we want to do is we want to slide that TNZ into these pins, right? And Actually, it's going to be soldered in place, right? But for the development board, I was using the same technique. So in general, if your goal is to solder something onto a board um, where you want to put something into it, like a pin header or um, you know any, any connector like that, um, and you want to fix it in place, try to fix it in place with the thing that you want to put into it, because then it's guaranteed that it will fit and it will work well. Um, and even if there's like you know if if the Teensy had like super weird and odd shaped uh, pins or anything, uh, as long as I can sit it here like this, um, I'm confident that it's gonna work. I hope this wasn't too confusing uh, of an attempt of an explanation. Um, there's a lot of little tricks in soldering uh, like this um, that you can use that you pick up over time. And uh, yeah, I hope to just share a couple of them so that you know and you can try it. Um, I think we're gonna start soldering the top side of this. Um, it is like really stable. Like I can, I can just hold the board on this and it will not move. Um, checked out the Neo layout, cool, but looks mismatched for typing finish. Half of the words would end up on one hand. Yeah, that is not good. Um, the Neo layout was optimized for German, English and programming and maths in that order. Uh, so I'm sorry that finish is not on that list. Um, you know, maybe you need to do a finished version of Neo. Um, all right, cool. So it is going to be um, it's going to be imperative here that we don't accidentally uh, um, you know touch the connector with our soldering iron. So we'll need to be a little bit careful here with the angles, but it should be fine. So I'm kind of feeding the solder here uh, into at an angle, but onto the tip and the part at the same time, um, so that it heats up. Like the flux in it um, makes it flow around on the pin and that makes heating up the pin much, much quicker. Um, so like I understand and like the rule to feed the solder from the other side of the of the pin in this case, of the part in general. But I feel like for the very first solder joint that you make um, where you don't have any flux on your soldering iron tip, it is actually better to feed it onto the tip first so that you have some flux on there, you know, or maybe use explicit flux, like ex external flux, um, but if you have it, right, um, you don't necessarily need it. You can totally get by with a cheap soldering iron and some solder like I'm doing here right now. Want a Finnish slash programming layout? I'm now using Finnish QWERTY layout and it's okay with Go, but pretty poor match for many other languages, which is easily solved. Cool. Um, what I like about the Neo layout is that it is so widely available. Like in Linux distributions, it is available by default. Uh, on Chrome OS, it is available by default. Uh, I think on the Mac and on Windows, you need to install drivers. But given that I use Linux mostly and Chrome OS sometimes, I'm very happy that the layout that I'm using is available by default at the operating system level because it just makes it so much nicer, less to install. Um, also, especially on other computers, like, you know, um, 
getting your layout onto other computers when you when you want to use it is going to be tricky or at least inconvenient. All right, almost the first row done. First row done. This is the point where somebody needs to tell a joke on chat. So you mentioned you can finish the soldering today, but don't have software that works on this new Teensy. That is accurate. But I have software that works on two other Teensy versions that I can totally show you on my dev board. Um, the software for the Teensy 4.1 is a little bit more elaborate. 
because it uses a new uh, microcontroller actually. It's not just a more recent revision, it's a different microcontroller entirely. So the porting is a little bit more elaborate. Um, I have it partly done, but notably uh, the thing that is not yet done is the USB stack. <laughs> uh, so it's not gonna, like it's not gonna work as a keyboard yet. Um, but I have like a development kit here um, and I am, I am committed to actually doing the port. Uh, I just haven't invested a lot of time in it recently yet. Um, I wanted to get the PCB right first um, because you know the software, um, we can just add it um, you know, one by one, so to say. What do you call a freelance electrician? Please tell me. So these are hard, these pins are hard because you need to kind of like go at it from an angle without hitting the other parts on the board. And there's this huge SD card on the left hand side in the way. So yeah, um, you really need to give it a little bit more time here. Um, you know, and here there's the button on the other end, right? So this is like the third one is like one of the trickiest one. A soldier of fortune. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let me see. Let me try like, eh, it's hard. Let me try this angle, see if that works. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, maybe, no. Does not look good. Ugh, see, this is this is the tricky bit. So now let's see how we can salvage this. Um, maybe from the other side, go at it from this side. We want to have like as much contact with the uh, with both the the pad and the the pin and the soldering iron. And ideally, like the flux would just take care of most of this for us. Oh yeah, now it worked. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so yeah, just find the right angle. Should be fine. Okay. So, this was the Teensy top side. Um, now, <laughs> we actually also need the bottom side to actually make contact with all of our nice connections on the board here. Um, because currently, like, yeah, the Teensy is fixed in place, but it's not actually connected. And that is the important part. <laughs> so. And then afterwards, um, we're going to do the LEDs, which requires a little bit of a different technique. Uh, and then lastly, the KB500 thumb pad connectors, just for completeness, just to keep our options open here. By the way, the whole process of soldering can be done in less than an hour. Uh, I haven't like stopped the time and I haven't tried to like do it particularly quickly. I just looked at the time when I did one of my test boards uh, and it's really not, it's really not a long thing. Like realistically, like to build this project, now that you know all of the things uh, that you know from the stream. You just need to click two buttons, wait for all the parts to arrive, spend less than an hour soldering it, run a couple of commands to get QMK onto it and you're done. And that's like really not a big hurdle. I mean, yeah, it's a couple steps, it's a project, right? But as far as projects go, it's a pretty simple one. I guess for hand cam, the way to go is a ring light, so you don't have any hand shadows. But I guess today's the exception, not a regular thing. 
That's correct. Actually, we do have a ring light here at home. Um, though I don't want to run over and grab it and set it up, etc. Um, maybe if I do another, you know, another live demo heavy stream. Yeah. In general, you know, should be better prepared than today. Um, but I really wanted to get this out today because I spent a number of weeks on it. Uh, mostly waiting for new PCB prototypes to arrive and then testing them out and improving on them one by one. Uh, I can show you a couple of the revisions that I made uh, and a couple of the old boards that I have lying around here. Um, so I wanted to get this out ASAP um, so that interested people can at least start ordering it and then, you know, um, the, the software we can publish while people are waiting for the order. So... That's the that's the rationale. I don't think you can see it in the light particularly well, but um, there's like a little you know, there's there's a lot of residue from the flux um, on the board still, and it should be fine. Like it should not make a dent in how well the electronics work at all. But if you wanted to clean it up, there's like chemical cleaners that you can get for a couple of bugs. Um, I can show you later. I have one of them here. Um, but I also wanted to say that it is totally unnecessary to do so. Like it's only. On, on other boards, that might not be true. Like on other boards, you should probably clean them. At this board here, like the soldering parts are so far um, apart from each other. All of the traces are so big. Uh, this whole project is so simple. I would be so surprised if you managed to get a board that doesn't function just because it wasn't cleaned properly. Kind of bummed I gave my friend my old webcam self holding onto it now that I'm streaming. Yeah. It would be nice to have another camera for projects like my Novation and Launchpad work. Yeah. Um, you can totally use your phone, right? Um, I, I, I don't know what phone you have, but I have published an article about how I'm using my iPhone here for the camera, uh, a spare iPhone actually. Um, I assume that for Android, there's also like a bunch of these live cam apps that you could integrate very, very similarly. Almost done. Four points here, five points there, and then we have the teens in place. The reason I started that is because I want to build a more general project to automate things with it. I haven't gotten very far yet. <laughs> All right. What sort of things do you want to automate with it? I 
basically want to make a full open source Stream Deck daemon. What sort of features do you expect from Stream Deck? Sweet, I wanted to get into producing music again. Cleared out my drawers, project books in my local hackerspace to get my 808 BD clone back. Nice. Toggling lights, changing OBS settings, etc. I just use my iPad for that. Uh, actually, any device will work. There's like the, uh, you know, the OBS remote browser client. Um, is it is is like the stream deck going to be much more convenient for you than you know using a screen? Okay, um, cool. So we are now like almost done, right? This is this is where we are. We have all of the connectors in place. We have the Teensy in place. Um, we need to still add the KB500, and we still need to add the LEDs. The LEDs are the ones where the technique matters now, um, and I'm gonna show you. Um, and then we're gonna add like the, the other headers uh, at the very, the very last step. Um, cool, cool. Well, this is, uh, this is taking pretty long already. Um, toggling lights, changing OBS settings, sounds very sci-fi-esque, yeah. I would prefer physical buttons for things like mic muting, yeah. I just have my keyboard. You know, I like my keyboard. <laughs> um, cool. Pin headers, we're done with that. Actually, we still need two more, but these are these are too many. I think I have um, have like this other baggie here of pin headers uh, where we have exactly the right number of pins already pre-cut. Uh, because, you know, I figured when I order from DigiKey, why not? Why not get the right part to begin with? All right, but now to the LEDs actually, and that is the, the more interesting bit. Um, can't find the uh, resistor package that I already opened, so I'm just gonna use the new ones. Scanline built her own keyboard to switch scenes, etc., for her live streams. Yeah, see, I, I did consider this, and I did actually like uh, the very the very first or second stream or so. Um, I was actually using like um, I was using a, an actual keyboard. Um, let me show you. Actually, I have it I have it right here. Um, I was using this keyboard, and I had it just like turned around and I was just using the F keys as like uh, special dedicated buttons, right? Uh, and it turns out that I didn't really need that. Uh, it was you know, just as convenient to just push the F keys on my regular keyboard, which I already have in my hands anyway. So I don't know, like the, the separate devices for this kind of stuff, maybe it's just not for me. Okay, so um, tool time. Now, for the SMD stuff, we need one crucial tool, uh, and that is a pair of tweezers, uh, such as this one here, which uh, I think I got for like 10 bucks at an electronic store. Um, we need, you know, any, any pair of tweezers will do, but I like the one that have sort of the bent tip um, because we'll be able to squeeze it together and then actually push down a part onto the PCB. Um, and we'll also be able to like, uh, you know, leave it open and then uh, take apart. Um, and we will also be able to use the tip to like move the part out of its packaging. Um, oops, sorry. I think what's also cool is that devices like the Launchpad and Stream Deck can also be used as miniature displays to indicate if something is on off current levels, etc. Yeah, that I think is the one advantage um, because the while the um, iPad, like the OBS remote client I'm using on the iPad has good controls for everything, uh, the volume levels are just not integrated at all. Like there is, well, I think the control is just for 
you know the 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 volume setting or the the um the, the gain i suppose is what it's called but uh the actual levels are not displayed so that would be cool um and and also yeah having like a bright light uh when you're muted or not muted would also be cool um i guess i, I agree there it's just not so much of an upgrade for me to really warrant having like another device uh lying around here uh, can i actually see this okay so let me try to like um, open this up here by going under the very top layer of foil. Um, this packaging is called cut tape. Um, this is because it's sort of like it's a reel of tape really, right? So it's like bent um, around like a, a large reel actually at the electronics distributor and then they have like you, you see these little uh, these little sorry you see these little holes in here uh, and they have a machine which will just you know, wind off enough of the reel, like, you know, if you order 10, it will reel of 10, though, you know, 10 is common enough that there's a prepack for it. But if you order 14, uh, it will reel of 14 and then make a cut and then just send you the result. Um, so these are not very, very user friendly, so to say, um, to work with, but it's fine. We're going to get it open. Um, so this was, I opened a little bit more than I was bargaining for. Let me see if I can open it up properly on the other side. Sometimes the cuts are just not so nice to work with. It's proving hard, proving stubborn. Hmm. Nope. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I guess you know we could make our own cut too. Um, definitely after after taking the first resistor. Ah, there we go. This is what I wanted to do. Uh, let me actually just use my hands here. Okay. So the tape needs to go off like this. And then we also need to take the part out of, of the packaging. Um, this will be easier for the, for the second. Oh, yeah, the, the first one I kind of screwed up. Uh, never mind me. <laughs> um, but I did manage to, to get one out. So um, I'm going to show you how this works in principle. Cool. So um, how well can you see that? Let me see. This is, this is going to be tricky. Um, all right. So the LEDs are all here, right? We have the LED uh, at the very left uh, corner of the board at, at the left edge. Um, and then we have the resistor. And we always have LED resistor, LED resistor, LED resistor, etc. cetera. Um, the resistor, it is not a directional part. However, uh, it has a marking. So if you look closely, you can see that it says uh, 1002. Um, well, you can't see it on camera, but it does say 1002, uh, which is 1002, so it's a 10K, um, uh, a 10K resistor. Um, you can like look up how the marking works specifically, but it's just exponents. Uh, and it's like a shorthand form of the resistor value. So, you know, for reverse engineerability later on, if you have like a board and you wonder, well, are the LEDs soldered incorrectly? It's gonna be very simple because it says 10K on the silk screen. And then if you can read the marking and it also confirms that it's a 10K resistor, you know, everything is in order. Um, here, you could also then see if you added like a different resistor value, um, you would see that it's different uh, from the silk screen to what you actually have put in. Uh, personally, I like to align the resistors such that um, the marking is readable in the same orientation that the silk screen is readable. So in this case, um, I would rotate it like so. Um, the 10K is written here, so the 1002 goes in sort of this horizontal alignment, uh, and that's the way I place this particular resistor. Now, oh, um, I should have done the resistors and LEDs after I did the Molex connectors. Uh, so I will, I will need to <laughs> make a note of this in the soldering guide because right now um, the board kind of doesn't stand so well on its own because the teensy is already in there. Um, well, I mean, the, the um, actually, I think it's standing on these, um, it's standing on the pin headers. So I suppose if we were to actually add the pin headers for the KB500, that would give us even more stability and maybe make the LEDs a little bit simpler. But I think I'm just gonna give these LEDs a try uh, and see if they work out like this. And you know, at increased difficulty level, so to say. And if no, we're gonna, we're gonna change the approach. 
Um, so the approach we're going to take here is um, we're going to add solder to one pad um, and we're going to do it sort of one-handed. So one of my hands is going to hold a tweezer, the other hand is going to hold a soldering iron tip, um, or the soldering iron rather, <laughs> the, the tip is not going to be touched. Um, and then I have like a little bit of solder um, just dangling around in the air like you know, here, just, just off camera. Um, and we're going to make it so that uh, I'm going to hold the part here. Let's see, yeah, that seems, that seems good. So now I'm going to pick up the solder. Um, I'm going to add it here. I'm just going to wait a little while. Move around a little bit. All right, there we go. So now that I removed the tweezers, uh, you can see the part is still in place. Uh, it is now held by uh, the soldering joint that we just made. So now we have an opportunity to do the other soldering joint and then to kind of rework the original one if need be. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do now is uh, from the other end, we're gonna go here, um, heat up this side like part and pad, as in the soldering instructions, right? Um, add a little solder. Wait until the flux flows. Remove the tip. There we go. And now, now that we have it held in place by both of the sides, we can rework the original side, just heat it up again. Add like just tiniest drop of fresh solder so we get some fresh flux. Uh, and then remove the tip again. And this will make the, the soldering joint uh, definitely work. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Like there's better better methods that you can do if you have better equipment. But this is a very easy to apply method. Um, you know, basically it works with any soldering iron. Um, as long as you have enough space on the pads that you can place the, the, the parts in the middle. Um, but uh, in this particular case, the footprints that I used for the resistors are the KiCad footprints that are specifically tailored for hand soldering of them. So they have a little bit of extra space. Um, so that should make soldering easy. All right, so this worked out well enough that I think I'm just gonna do the others as well. Um, could you also just solder the pad first and then apply the part? Yes, you can. But the downside is that if you already have the solder on the pad, it'll be hard to place the part such that the part is really flat on the board. And you do want that for maximum mechanical stability um, because otherwise it might just break off. Um, you know, the chance is small that it actually does break off, but it's best if your part is aligned flat with the board. Um, and what I like to do is I, I like to press the part flat onto the board while I solder because then there's never any question about is it aligned correctly. And if you do the solder the one pad first and then add the part, um, you need to kind of press the part and then heat up the solder again so that it flows again and then press the part down some more. And in that process, it has happened to me a number of times that the part would like fly off the board uh, because you, know, you apply pressure in one direction, so to say. Uh, and then the direction kind of changes because you change what's on the board. And it, you know, it, it kind of works. But I prefer my method because it's a method that I can apply more consistently, more easily for me. Um, but if you find that my method doesn't work well for you, totally try the solder on the pad first because it works well for many people. I I'm just saying for me personally, uh, it didn't work out so well. Um, so yeah, your mileage may vary. All right, second one, uh, soldering iron, tweezers. Pick up the solder. Come on. There are a couple of good guides on SMD soldering, by the way. Um, I haven't linked any, but I totally should now that I talk about it. Yeah, so now the part moved very slightly while I was soldering it. Um, good enough that I don't want to rework it. Uh, the, the, uh, let's see, can I, can I, yeah, there you go. Um, 
you can see that you know the, the second resistor, the numlock 10k resistor R2, is ever so slightly skewed. Not a big deal. Uh, the soldering joint is still very good. Uh, it's going to make contact and connection just fine. Um, I'm not going to bother. In general, this is this stuff is relatively forgiving, so don't sweat it. Uh, even if if yours doesn't look anywhere close to mine, fine, it's still gonna work probably. I'm not saying that mine looks particularly good. Uh, this is a soldering iron that I have only used a couple of times. Um, I'm mostly using this soldering iron to show that it can be done on like a very cheap beginner soldering iron. Um, not because I actually like this so much. Like I have a, a different soldering iron that I would otherwise use. So number three or four, and then afterwards we're gonna to go to the LEDs. And then we're gonna have a keyboard controller built live. Very nice. Um, this goes here. I'm going to try to adjust a little bit. In general, I would recommend uh, you use your hands and fingers uh, for the the rough alignment, and then only like the very very tiny adjustments you do using the tweezers, because the tweezers are just an extra tool, like an extension of your limbs um, that you need to learn how to use. So you're going to be more skilled with your fingers. So as long as the parts are large enough um, that your fingers can get them roughly in place. Start with the fingers and only afterwards use the tweezers. It's going to save you some frustration. Uh, by the way, uh, if you think the LEDs are sort of hard to begin with, you don't actually need to add them at all, right? Uh, if you're fine with not having a caps lock indicator, you know, because maybe your operating system tells you or you're fine just pressing a key and seeing if it comes up uppercase or lowercase, uh, you don't need any of these LEDs, strictly speaking. The project's going to work fine without any of these, um, but it would be cool. Uh, suspect these sorts of delicate operations are where I would really struggle with soldering. Oh, don't worry. Um, I think you can do it. I think everyone can do it. Um, notice you're holding the iron at the far end middle. Is this due to the connector of your power supply? I'm um, gonna say yes. Huh. Now I'm self-conscious about how I hold this. Yeah, um, I hold it at the in the middle because then, you know, um, let me show you. Uh, let me show you without burning my cable. Um, there we go. Yeah, the connector is kind of large, so it kind of rests in my hand, um, and that's why I'm holding it at a weird angle. One of the advantages of the TS100 is its short tip. Huh, yeah, I guess. Um, last resistor, this goes back into the bag. Um, I find that it is good practice whenever you are using lots of small electronics parts um, to always keep them in the bags as much as possible um, because if you leave them out uh, you're going to confuse which ones go where and uh, that's how you end up making mistakes. So only take them out while you need them. Put them right back when you no longer need them. Oh, um, by the way, one more thing. Uh, if you are so against soldering that you just don't want to solder this, you don't need to. You can just order it and have people solder it for you. Um, I think JLPCB or was it JLCPCB? They offer, oh, PCB Way offers this for sure. Um, I think it's called assembly service. Um, many of the larger houses do it. Though, you know, for this particular project, I think it would be a waste of money. 
because it really takes you less than an hour. So it's not, it's not the time that um, you're going to save by paying somebody money. Um, and you know, this I'm, I, I definitely trust that people can learn this skill. Um, if it doesn't work out for you, you know, set up a call and I can work, walk you through it, whatever mistake you might be making. But I don't think, I don't think it's hard to mess up at all. And it's easy to fix as well, especially with these SMD parts, um, as you can just totally like unsolder uh, one pad of it um, and then unsolder, unsolder the other pad of it and then just remove the part and do it again. You can probably solder onto these pads a couple of times, maybe like five times or so before they start showing anywhere. Um, so you have a couple of tries to make it right, so no worries. And as I mentioned, like even if you make, even if you get the LEDs totally wrong, uh, it it still doesn't matter, right? The worst that can happen is that you will not have LEDs, but you can always fix it later. Used mine with a laptop charger and its original cable it was too stiff to hold it from two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the cable situation is definitely like the big issue with the TS one hundred. Okay, um, we have the resistors. Let's add the LEDs. So, um, these come in a slightly different packaging. Um, it is still uh, cut tape, but you can see that it is a little bit different in that, um, well, first of all, I already opened it, but it's no longer like the paper thing. It's more of a, a plasticky packaging. Anyway, um, so what I'm gonna do here is um, I already have it open. Just gonna like pull off the opening for one more part and then I'm just going to let it fall out onto the board, um, move these away, and I'm going to repeat this for every single LED that we need. Now, this LED, let me see if I can, I can show this to you. Huh. Let me see if this works. Oh, wow. Um, it has markers on the left side. You see the two little dots at the top and at the bottom? These are the markers for the cathode. So this is where uh, you know the the marking on the silk screen comes in, right? So we need to make sure that the green dots, the marking on these LEDs, is on the right side, where we have the marker on the silk screen as well. Still doable though, as you demonstrate really nicely. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, that is that is what I want to show here. Like it is really everybody can do it. It is very simple. I encourage you all to build your own keyboards. Cool. So this footprint is not as suitable for hand soldering. So you need to like pay attention to the alignment a little bit more than for the resistors. So start with the resistors and then move on to the LEDs. It's going to be fine. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, if, if you've never SMD soldered before, take the four resistors as practice and then uh, with your newfound confidence and skill, move on to the LEDs. All right, let's see if we can add these LEDs here. Should do it. Kinda. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, take some more solder so I get some more flux. Try again. And just like hold for two seconds before I move off. Yeah, this should do it. All right, and now the other pad. All right. Cool. Okay, so this is the first LED. Um, let me show you. Oh yeah, see now in the light, you can see all of the residue, like all over the board, the little sprinkles, uh, this is all flux. 
um, this is what the PCB cleaner will get off. Um, but as I mentioned, it's probably not going to be a problem. The real pain at SMD soldering is to get something off without destroying the soldering point. Yeah. Um, it's going to be fine for these little parts here, though, that only have uh, two pads. Um, so uh, what I would recommend, you know, if you wanted to get one off, um, obviously first uh, heat up this soldering joint, heat up this soldering joint, use some desoldering wick to remove all of the solder, then grab the pad in the middle and pull up with your tweezers and then heat up the soldering joints again, like what is left of them, right? Um, that should be sufficient to get the part off. Um, actually, let me rework the upper um, soldering joint here so that we can add a little more flux to it um, and make it a little more complete because currently it only covers sort of part of the pad and I want it to be real nice. Yeah, that's better. Um, cool, so yeah, that's how the LEDs work. We're gonna add three more of them and then we're gonna have like a functional keyboard controller without functional software. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna show you the dev board and then I think we're gonna call it a day because we have been at it for a long time. Um, but I hope it is interesting to you and um, certainly building a keyboard controller on stream is not something that one does every day, especially not for its release. So I think this is kind of cool. Second one done, two more to go. One more to go.
trying to center it here. Okay, done. So this was the most finicky part. Um, and as I mentioned, it is entirely optional. Like, yeah, if you can live without the LEDs, just skip it. Uh, I, in fact, I have a couple of keyboard controller boards here lying here on which I never bothered to put in the LEDs. It's fine. All right, two more pin headers to go for compatibility with the KB500. Now, these pin headers, uh, let me show you here. Um, we need to kind of fix them in place, right? Um, because currently, uh, as you can see, they wobble around. Um, the way to do this, or you know, one way to do this, is uh, to just use your finger, like I'm showing here. You, know, you just use your fingernail to like, really press this onto the board. And then the trick is to not solder in that area at all and solder the opposite end because these get really hot. So you need to be careful to not burn yourself. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, on here, like you can see that as I wobble the pin header, you can see the pins themselves wobble. So I'm gonna use the pins themselves here as a, uh, sort of an indicator of how straight or how flat to the board um, my pin header is. And then I'm gonna solder this very far pin here first. And then I'm gonna wait for it to cool down, re-grab the pin header, solder the other end, and then solder the ones in the middle because then it's gonna be fixed in place. This is one of these um, where creative use of solder uh, in terms of placement is going to be required, I feel, because I only have so many hands. And, you know, I could get my third hand. I actually have a, like a quad hands kind of thing. Um, but I feel like it is going to be more realistic if I show you how to do it the hacky way. Um, because let's face it, if this is a beginner project, you're not going to have access to like a, a third hand. Maybe. And if you do, then just use that instead. So, cool. Um, there you go. Well, let me see. Let me see if I can like move this here. And then kind of just like move the board into it. it doesn't work so well. It kind of depends on the solder that you have as well. Um, sorry, I understand this is a little bit off camera right now. I'm gonna try and show you sort of what I did in just a sec. Okay, um, masking tape. Yeah, yeah, man, masking tape. That sounds so professional. Um, I'm trying to run like a lightweight operation here. So uh, you can see, you know, it's kind of in place. It's kind of straight. There's like a little bit of solder on the very far end pin, enough to hold it in place. Um, I'm gonna do like the very other one, uh, the one at the very other end, uh, like this. And like if, I don't know if you can see it, but it still kind of wobbles if you were to wobble it. So you wanna like keep a steady hand on this one. But now that it's dry or, you know, cool, um, it's, it's gonna stay in place, like all of them are gonna stay in place. So now we can just like go one by one and just solder them uh, as before, uh, straightforward. And now that we have the second one, we can also actually redo the first one properly because it didn't have good contact. It was just to hold the pin header in place.
So you can see that it's kind of easier if you wanted to build a KB600 only keyboard controller, but many people are still on the KB500, so I figured I'd show this as well. Uh, in particular, uh, on eBay, you can find a lot of KB500s, uh, not a lot of KB600s, at least not used ones because they're too new yet. Uh, maybe this changes in five to 10 years. Almost done with this pin header. Ah, nice. One more pin header to go. Are you excited? Almost done. Doesn't want to go where I want it to. Oh no, there we go. Yeah, that is sort of the effect that I was hoping for. Um, I don't know if you could see that so well right now, but essentially I had just a solder here and I was moving the board so that the solder would flow into the, the, the pin, right? Um, that's sort of the poor man's third hand, gravity. Uh. Cool. And now the rest is very straightforward. Two more to go. And the last one. Nice. There we are. Keyword controller finished. Um, yeah. This is the uh, end result. Let me uh, angle this slightly. Hmm. Nice, huh? Um, there we are. So we can now totally connect this to USB. Um, I'm gonna do this just so that you can see that it shows up um, on USB. Um, we can also totally put it into a keyboard. I'm also gonna do that. Um, and then, well, actually, I think I'm gonna skip this, but I'm gonna put like uh, the development one into the keyboard, and then I'm gonna show you how to flash the firmware. Um, so that you have seen all of the things, except not necessarily on the same device, but as I mentioned, software not entirely ready. Um, so that's the trade-off that we need to do. So, um, soldering iron goes off. 
and into the stand. Uh, tweezers get their cap on. And the sponge goes here. Oh, there's an extra pin header we need to clean up. All right, so let me fetch my USB cable. And then go connect this here. Uh, this is just a standard micro USB cable. Um, and then I'm going to switch back to my stream view here, switch here, um, real quick, let me figure out the correct command to use for this, Come this should be it, I think, yeah. Uh, Plug it in, now let's see. Woo, there we go. So this is the Teensy um, showing up as like the Teensy Duino device. So we can now program it using uh, um, you know, the, the, the Teensy software. Uh, we're not gonna do that, but um, I'm gonna show you how this whole process works with a different controller of mine, for which I actually have working software. Um, so, let me use this opportunity to re-set up my camera so that I can show you the keyboard. And I think I'm gonna risk it without battery for the remaining couple minutes here. And then switch to here, cool. Okay, so move my keyboard out of the way. This is the one we just built. Um, but now, as I mentioned, Teensy 4.1 is too new. So we're going to switch to my development keyboard. Uh, this is the KB600 uh, development keyboard. Um, hmm. Okay, there's some like leftover plastic in here. Just want to like give my desk a very, very quick swipe. Um, just for the like, you know, coarsest of residue here. All right, um, and now we're gonna use the uh, the venerable old uh, Teensy Plus Plus Atmel one um, because this is actually my Teensy Plus Plus dev board that I have in here. Um, it has the solder jumpers on the back connected, so you can see here in the one that we just built together. Uh, the three solder jumpers here are not connected. Uh, this is the default setup for the newer Teensy revisions, but for the very old one Teensy++, you actually need to close these. Um, and you also need to not connect a couple of pins. Um, if I show you the PCB again, you might have wondered um, what... Um, where do we have it? Here. Um, what on the front side, these little X's next to pin 15, 16, and seven mean. And these are the ones that um, on the Teensy++ you must not connect. Um, this is also explained in the soldering instructions, but they essentially have an incompatible uh, signal on these pins. So what I've done here is I have just modified my pin header to not have these two affected pins here and the one affected pin over there. Like I just removed the pins with a pair of pliers. Uh, and this is fine to do. Um, and then you can just close the solder jumpers um, and plug in your Teensy++ like so. Um, and now I can actually use this as a keyboard uh, and reprogram it as a keyboard. Did you prototype this on a breadboard before this dev board? Um, I did do some prototyping. So uh, let me see if I, I don't, I don't think I have like, oh, I think the very, very old prototype, um, I have it, but um, yeah, I, maybe I can look it up later. Um, so this is, a, this is a much older version of the old Teensy++ uh, keyboard controller. 
Um, you can see that it has the Teensy++ still soldered in like the wrong way around or like, you know, on top. Um, and I knew that this was work, this would work. Um, so the prototyping that I did was um, I needed to, like I, I used the same keyboard matrix as before, but I needed to change the wiring, like which signals go into which pin of the microcontroller. So what I did was I used a known working prototype uh, or board like the one I just showed you, um, but instead of connecting um, a, a Teensy directly onto it, um, what I did was this. Uh, so I have like just a bunch of jumper wires in between a Teensy and this uh, development board here um, with which I can just change all of the wiring, right? <laughs> Amazing, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is the reason. This is uh, the 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 backstory for the tweet a while ago, where I was like, you know how you never have enough jumper wires, and then I just ordered fifty francs worth of jumper wires. Uh, that was for this particular exercise, and now I have like jumper wires over jumper wires over jumper wires over jumper wires. But uh, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a lot of jumper wires. <laughs> you can always use them for shenanigans like this. Um, yeah, uh, this is how I prototyped the matrix um, and then, uh, or the wiring of the matrix. And then let me show you, uh, I have like, uh, yeah, I have like an older revision here uh, of, the, of the board where, um, this is uh, version 2020.06.15. Uh, so just you know, two, two versions before the final version. Um, a couple of things went actually wrong. Uh, notably, the cutout at the top was not large enough, uh, which is really annoying because you know, that means the board will just not fit properly into your keyboard. So I had to make a new revision anyway. Um, you can also see that um, I had to add an extra wire here to make an extra signal. Um, and you can also see that the solder jumpers were really different in terms of footprint. Um, I used a different footprint before, just a resistor footprint. Um, but then MXF actually told me about these solder jumper footprints and they're actually so much better. Um, so, you know, a couple of changes like this. Oh, and also notably, uh, you can see here that um, if you, if you look, there's only like one um, horizontal pin header here. Um, this is because at the time, I didn't know that um, the Teensy++ had a different position and also the Teensy 4.0 and 3.0 also have different positions for the horizontal ones. So all three generations of Teensy's have different positions. Um, so that's why in the very latest one, um, you know, we have these three horizontal lines here, right? Um, the one for the Teensy 4, the one for the Teensy 4.1, and the one for the Teensy++. Um, so most of the iterations of this project were actually uh, in you know, mechanical uh, and, and device compatibility. Uh, and most of the work before then was just uh, schematics, planning, um, making things nicer, etc. cetera, um, you know, which is often the case in electronics projects. So um, back, to, back to our experiment though. So um, I need to use a different cable because this is micro USB. Um, and, oh, I, I don't know. Oh yeah, here is it. Um, so the old TNZ++ has um, mini USB, uh, which is why we need a different cable here. Let's plug this in here. Um, we're gonna turn it around. And then I'm gonna plug it in here. And I'm gonna switch back to my stream here. So, um, there we go, yeah. Um, cool, so you can already see that um, it shows up as the proper product in USB. Uh, <laughs> uh, QMK by default sets the manufacturer to U. <laughs> so uh, Linux registers the U kinesis. Um, and then it also has like you know a bunch of different input kinds so that you know all of the multimedia stuff uh, can be properly uh, mapped so to say from the um, QMK key map to you know whatever Linux takes. 
Um, but now, um, let me see, I can say hello from my keyboard. Um, uh, look at me while I'm typing this. There you go. Uh, so this works, right? This is uh, the KB600 uh, using the Teensy++, so very old Atmel uh, microcontroller, but you know, known working. Um, latest controller revision, latest keyboard revision, no problem at all. Um, let me show you how to actually update the firmware on this. Um, this is, uh, so wait, so how, how are we gonna do this? Um, I think what we wanna do, wait, that keyboard is way too silent. What's wrong with it? Yeah, it has the red cherry on axis. Um, that's going to be subject of another stream um, to actually fix that. Um, actually, let me let me take a look. Oh, this is uh, this is where my this is where my other keyboard is hiding. So actually, I'm going to show you the firmware update on the other one, um, so that you can have the 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 typing sounds, the pleasant typing sounds. Because uh, <laughs> why not? Um, no more seriously though. I don't have like a Teensy plus plus checkout ready, so uh, it's actually more convenient for me. Uh, to do, come on, uh, to do this one here, um, you know, where, um, sorry, like this, yeah, I have the Teensy 3.6 in here. Uh, so we're going to go back to the micro USB cable. Go in here, go in there. Cool. Stream default. Uh, this is now a KB500 again, but uh, listen to this. Yeah, much better, right? Much more satisfying. Cool. Um, so, um, oh, I, I did I did flash the uh, I did flash it without my key map. But do I still have that somewhere? It looks like no. That's cool. We can just rebuild. Just noticed this stream, huh? <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and watch the whole thing. Oh yes. Did you solder in a Teensy or was this keyboard using one before? I did solder in a Teensy. This keyboard was not using one before. However, um, the more recent, um, let me show you. Oof, where is it? Too much stuff, but yeah, here we go. Um, Ta-da. So this is the original Kinesis keyboard controller. Uh, while they do not use a Teensy, they do use an Atmel processor in the very latest revision. So technically, very similar, um, but it is a different different thing, uh, different revision for sure. Um, and I don't know if you could even update the firmware uh, on, the, on, the up, on the original Kinesis one. That would be a cool project too, like figuring out if you could build QMK to run on the original one. Um, I don't know how you would flash it though, if you'd need like a programmer or a JTAG of sorts. Cool, um, so in here I have uh, a couple of changes um, that make it work on the on the Teensy 3.6. Um, just gonna compile this. I'm gonna push these as I mentioned. Um, you know, seeing as how late it has gotten, I'm not gonna release it today, I think. I'm gonna release it tomorrow morning, um, but it shall be online very soon. Um, so we're going to do a QMK flash for this. Um, and now it's saying waiting for Teensy device, hint, press the reset button. So, okay, turn the keyboard around, uh, locate that Teensy, press the reset button, switch back to stream default. Um, you can see, oh, this goes very quick. Like you couldn't even see it on the stream. I'm sorry. Um, we can do it again and you just trust me that I'm pushing this button. Um, if I do a flash, cluck. Ta-da! Um, and yeah, uh, so if we do the, um, oh, sorry. Um, if we do the journal cuddle again, and we're gonna flash it again, and we're gonna press that button, you can see how it disappears on USB and then comes back on USB, right? Um, and uh, now you can also see that the um, Teensy 3.6 version actually has the manufacturer is set to my GitHub and the product set to the GitHub for this repository. 
and um, it also uses the um, vendor and product IDs that I actually have gotten assigned to this project. Um, there is a cool a project called, I, I, I want to say pit.codes or something, um, where you can, as an open source project, register USB vendor and pit combinations, um, which is super helpful because then you can actually get it into like the operating systems, hardware databases and get like speaking names for everything. Um, speaking of speaking names, did you know that there's not only LSUSB like so, there's also lsusb.py, uh, which shows you a tree overview, and it shows you which USB at which speed has, uh, you know, is is negotiated here, um, and how much power the device says it's drawing, um, and it's all formatted nicely, etc. Right? Uh, yeah, today I learned. Right? Yeah, lsusb.py. Nobody fucking knows. And the reason is that it is not included in Debian uh, for, I don't know why, but it is included in Arch Linux for many, many, many years. Uh, so this is like part of the official LSUSB package. It's just some distributions don't include it. I don't know why. Uh, it seems so much better in terms of output. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is what we just programmed, right? The um, uh, Kinti keyboard controller here, um, currently registered at USB 1.1 um, because of the TNZ 3.6. Um, we're going to do the 4.1, which is going to be USB 2.0. Um, yeah, this is currently at 12 megabits, but that is the maximum for USB 1.1. LSUSB also has a tree view, but doesn't show power as far as I remember. Um, LSUSB T for tree view. Yeah. Um, it kind of shows the speed here. It doesn't show the power. It is nowhere near as nice as the output of this though, um, I think. Uh, yeah. And it has colors. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so you've seen the firmware flashing. It is super easy, right? You, you push the button, it takes the new firmware. Um, if it works, it comes back as a keyboard. Uh, if it doesn't, you just fix your problem and try again. Um, nothing can really go wrong here. Cool. Um, so I think we are like pretty much at the end of the scheduled program. Um, do you have any questions? Is there like anything unclear? You know how to build this now, right? Like, you know, if, 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 if you were in need of fixing a Kinesis keyboard, you would know how to do it. Um, if not, now is the time to ask, right? Because that was really the goal um, of this particular stream um, to show you like the new and improved keyboard controller right here. Um, I should totally add like a little picture as well. So yeah, here, for, for those of you who have only tuned in later, um, here is a 3D render of the board uh, front and back, rather front and back. Um, schematic, actually twice, uh, a QMK firmware, which we have installed. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be uh, released tomorrow, at which point you can just click buy PCB on Oshpark, buy parts on Octopart, um, which will lead you to either Digi Key or Mouser. Um, for the PCB, as I mentioned, uh, three of them will cost you 72 US dollars, so just, just over 20 bucks uh, per board. Uh, if you wanna do a group order, you're welcome to do a group order, um, share some keyboard love with other people in your area. Um, the parts from Octopart, if you don't have a Teensy yet, uh, the complete bill of materials will clock you uh, clock in at 50 bucks. Um, so 50 bucks plus like the 26 bucks, or if you can't do a group order, uh, 50 bucks plus the 70 bucks. So just a little under 150 for your own keyboard from scratch, uh, provided you have a Kinesis hardware. <laughs> so not entirely from scratch, but you know, your own keyboard electronics from scratch. Have you done a stream about designing PCB files? Something I've always wanted to learn to do. I have not. Um, I can show you a little bit about you know how the how the um, design of this particular project um, was was done, but I'm by no means an expert on anything electronics. Like um, I know my way around a design tool, um, but you know I, I wouldn't be able to explain in depth all of the things. Um, so if you know if that's cool with you though, um, we can totally talk about this um, a little more on a future stream. I'm gonna do like a couple more keyboard streams, at least one more um, where I fix the, the weird noises that um, my other Kinesis keyboard does. Um, I've, I've told you it has the MX red and like they're just not acceptable, right? We need to change them for MX blues. 
Um, I, I'm going to give you like going to give you like a little sneak peek of this. Uh, stay tuned here. Uh, okay. Look at this. Ah. Uh. All right. So what I have here is the Advantage 2 kit, uh, which um, Hobbyist 2, so anything you know is all new information to me. Oh, glad to hear. So um, if you ask Kinesis nicely, they're going to send you this, which is essentially, well, I mean, you need to pay for it, right? But they're, they're going to sell you this if you ask them nicely. Um, this is like the key wells, right? The plastic for the key wells. Um, then these are uh, the PCBs for the thumb pads. These are uh, the PCBs for the key wells. So uh, if you if you if you ever wondered how do they make these in such a way that they're bent like they are, right? Like you know if you if you look at that keyboard, it seems like the PCB is bent. Uh, and the way they accomplish this is they just make they just make a very thin PCB, right? Uh, and then and they just place it. They just they just bend it like so onto the key well and solder it in place. Um, there's really not much magic um, in this aside from you know probably the R and D that they had to do to figure out exactly how big these gaps need to be and how thin the PCB can be. I think also the PCB has gotten thinner on the Advantage 2 compared to the Advantage 1. Um, but it is very, very cool that we can actually obtain all of these parts and then just solder one together ourselves. Um, so there's a couple more parts in here. There's like the um, FPC cables uh, that we need to connect these up. But that is the, the essentially the contents of the kit. And then, uh, in order to fix the weird noises, I also got us um, a bunch of Blue Cherry MX key switches. Um, unfortunately, there is like one little twist here, which is that uh, Kinesis uses key switches with diodes in them. Uh, this is a good choice because it means that they can avoid N key rollover entirely and solve that problem once and for all, which not all keyboards can do. The more expensive ones can. Um, essentially, it means you know how many keys you can press at the same time in certain combinations, um, and the the Cherry MX Blue key switches that I bought here, you can get them easily. You can no longer get them with the diodes in them. Uh, Cherry stopped producing these in 2019. They declared them as obsolete. I don't know where Kinesis still gets their Cherry MX switches with diodes in them. Um, if you know, let me know. Um, but uh, luckily, you can just totally buy diodes on DigiKey as well. So what I did was um, I went through this bag of Cherry MX key switches and this bag of diodes and produced another bag of Cherry MX key switches that have diodes in them. Uh, you can see that they sort of have vampire fangs, so to say. <laughs> it looks kind of funny, the diodes sticking out of them. So in a future stream, what we're going to do is we're going to assemble all of this and we're going to make ourselves a very unique advantage too, one that you know probably nobody else on the planet has right now, that has blue Cherry MXs. Um, and it's going to be very satisfying to type on. Um, and, and very satisfying for you all to hear on stream. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jones, uh, why would you assemble it yourself versus ready? Uh, the ready ones, uh, they're fine, right? <laughs> like they sell them after all, but they have the brown cherry mixes or the red cherry mixes. And uh, in, in my opinion, only the blue cherry mixes are acceptable, at least to me. So um, that's why I'm a person who <laughs> builds their own Kinesis keyboards. Um, and at that point, you might be wondering, well, you know, how much is really left of that keyboard? If, you know, we, we have exchanged the keyboard controller itself, the board, and the key wells, and the key switches, well, really only the plastic <laughs> is left. Um, and the keycaps, of course, right? Um, the caps are, are kind of cool. Um, I, I haven't gotten into like my own custom caps yet. Um, I know that there's sometimes orders where people like print their own caps. Um, for me, it's fine. Uh, the, you know, they're labeled in QWERTY, which is actually, you know, when I'm typing Neo on them, I don't need the labels. And when I am typing QWERTY on them, it's kind of nice that they have the QWERTY labels. 
Um, but yeah, um, totally. Like the the F key rows, um, those are those are what we still use, right? Um, but aside from that, like all of the other PCBs and all of the other keys, um, aside from the plastic, we swap out everything. So you know, maybe a future direction for uh, keyboard hacking would be um, to make our own case, right? Um, and and you know make our make our own plastic mold or three D print uh, a keyboard. There are kind of cool uh, keyboards such as the Ergodox, um, which I think you can also do yourself. There's also the Dactyl, uh, which is three D printed and definitely you know produced on your own. Kind of wild, uh, what sort of material people use in here? Very colorful. Very neat. Uh, yeah, you can see clearly 3D printed. But see, this is split, right? Um, so, you know, maybe we could do something like this. Um, I have seen actually that QMK by default supports uh, split firmware um, via, I think, a one wire protocol um, where you only need like one connection. And what people frequently use are these like audio cables. Um, and then they just use like the 3.5 millimeter audio ports uh, on both ends. Because you know these cables are ubiquitous and they have enough connections uh, for for transmitting that data. Um, so in one end, like the keyboard controller would live, and in the other end, like only a very simple controller would live, and then the two would communicate with each other, and then one of them would be connected to the host via USB, um, and that way we could have a split keyboard. So that's a possibility as well. Um, I don't know where where this takes us and what I want to do really. Um, you know, I guess time will tell. But yeah, um, this is this is pretty much it for today. Um, assume those were RJ12 telephone cables. Um, no, not. I mean, the Kinesis one uses RJ11 or RJ12, but uh, the Ergodox, uh, sorry, the Dactyl that I just showed, um, they use audio cables. Um, I think pretty much everything self built uses audio cables. Um, yeah, why not? Cool. Um, so, yeah, this is going to go live tomorrow. Um, any, any last minute questions? Um, otherwise, uh, I'm gonna say thank you all for hanging out. Uh, it was a lot of fun to build this keyboard controller with you all. Um, let's, uh, let's actually uh, show it again. So this is the, the final product that we built today. Uh, Teensy 4.1, I hope that we will have software for this soon. We will definitely do the blue Cherry MX keyboard mod in another stream. Um, maybe we'll do one other. If you have any suggestions, if you have any questions, just let me know on Twitter, etc. Cool. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say uh, enjoy and see you in the next stream. Bye-bye.